of all, I wanted to welcome everybody to um, our December 7th commission meeting. I, those celebrating Hanukkah, Christmas, the holidays, etc. cetera, um, welcome. Good to have you here this, this afternoon. Um, we're going to start, uh, this is um, finishing the second week of Advent, and uh, in our church it was all about peace, so I think it's appropriate that Reverend Bob Scott from Peace Memorial Church come forward and give us the invocation, and then it'll be followed by the pledge. Please stand. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Let's pray. Source of all being and lover of our souls, we thank you. We thank you for this time of the year. Our homes and our city streets are brightly decorated. There's a chill in the air as well as music. Our shops and restaurants are crowded with coworkers and friends and family enjoying the season and one another. We have so much to be grateful for. But we also know that not everybody is so carefree. And so today we pray for those who are also careful. We pray for those who are hungry and not sure where their next meal will be coming for, from. We pray for the homeless and, and those without adequate shelter. We pray for the un and the underemployed. Help us to carry their burdens. And so to that end, I pray for this governmental body. And I pray for the offices and the civil servants, the public servants that support them. I thank you for all that you have called to this special work. And I pray that you will give them the wisdom and the will to do the work that is set before them today. In a time of deep division and political rancor, at least at the national level, I pray for this local body. I pray that you will give them common vision. I pray that you will give them common purpose and common cause and common concern for our communities and for one another. Finally, I pray that you give them good hope and good humor to be about the work that is before them. For all of this, we give thanks and we offer this prayer humbly and confidently in your holy name. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Reverend Scott. That was beautiful. I really appreciate your being here this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> uh, I guess a couple of weeks ago, um, I, I remembered a couple of things I wanted to do at this last meeting and didn't get the information into staff in time. So we have a, a, a proclamation and a couple of recognitions. Um, so with that said, I'm going to do a, 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 an acknowledgement and recognition of Pearl Harbor Day and then acknowledge um, uh, two members of our canvassing board. So hang in there with me. And uh, <clears throat> if Zephyr will come forward, please. He's our director of veteran services. Welcome. Good to see you. Please stand there. Um, yeah, this is a, 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 a 80th anniversary for crying out loud of Pearl Harbor, um, which is just amazing as the years go by and the decades go by. Um, didn't want the day to go by without at least remembering um, that uh, really day of infamy some, well, eight decades ago. Um, I'm going to read um, a proclamation here, but just thinking about the different folks that, that, that had impact uh, along the way, um, not only that day, but since that day. And once from those, from those days, it went into Korean War and, 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 and then have served this country in so many ways through, through mentoring, through 
whatever services, th those folks that are there that day that uh, really are part of that great generation, greatest generation. Um, a lady, uh, I guess uh, Lauren Bruner is, is, is the last expected survivor of the USS Arizona, for instance. And um, there's 151 World War II veterans that are expected to be at the Pearl Harbor event this year. 32 survivors of that day. Um, not, there's not, there, we don't think there's any more than 75 survivors thought to still be alive. That's according to Kathleen Farley of the sons and daughters of the uh, Palm, uh, Pearl Harbor survivors. So they're, they're becoming less and less, but still the story and, the, and remembering that day is uh, truly important. Um, and I wanted to, thought about trying to get a history professor here to see, make sure that they're still doing that in schools and teaching this historical occasion. Um, and I asked Zephyr to be here uh, uh, on behalf of the veterans across our Bay Area. So with that said, it's Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day, and whereas on Sunday, December 7th, just before 8 a.m., hundreds of Japanese fighter planes and submarines attacked the United States Naval Base of Pearl Harbor, and in just over an hour, the surprise attack destroyed or damaged more than 300 aircraft, 19 Navy ships, including eight battleships, and more than 2,400 Naval personnel and civilians died in the battle over uh, battle, and over 1,100 were injured. And Franklin Delano Roosevelt called it a day that will live in infamy, a declared war on Japan the following day, on December 8, 1941. And three days later, Japan, Japan's allies, Germany and Italy, declared war against the United States, thus beginning, thus the beginning of World War II. In August 1994, the United States Congress designated December 7th of each year as National Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day. And in 2021, the attack on Pearl Harbor will honor its 80th anniversary. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed by the Pinellas County Board of County Commissioners that we honor the military, civilians, survivors, and veterans affected by the attack on Pearl Harbor and encourage all people in our county to remember the tremendous sacrifices made by men and women during World War II and on behalf of our nation by recognition of Pearl Harbor Remembrance Day, 80th anniversary. Thank you. And Zephyr. <laughs> Say a few words, please, please. If I could, quickly. On behalf of the 85 plus thousand veterans and families living in Pinellas County, and to bring Pearl Harbor re remembrance closer to home, nearly 6,000 World War II veterans live currently among us here in Pinellas County. This means these heroes were serving during this time, and they're right here with us. So thank you for remembering and recognizing this tragic event. Thank you so much. And the second thing that uh, I didn't get in on time, but I did remember, um, sitting with um, the folks at the canvassing board during the last election, the St. Pete election, um, in November, and I was thinking about a couple of the members there um, that, uh, well, that, that just have played such a big impact, have had such a big impact on our county, but also specifically on the canvassing board. So I'd like to ask Herb Polson to come forward. Um, also, Judge Carassus and Dustin Chase from the Supervisor of Elections Office representing Julie Marcus, and I know that she was out of town or she would be here. Um, and first, I just wanted to acknowledge Herb. Um, he um, has been ar around, as you all know, any of you chair folks that have been on, uh, been on the uh, canvassing board has been a, a member of the canvassing board uh, forever. And anytime you call him, he just 
So of course I'm available. Um, and this year in particular, it was, it was difficult because one day I was available, the next day I wasn't, the next day I was, and every time that I wasn't there, Herb was there, smiling and being a, a very, very uh, big part of our canvassing board. And so I just really wanted to thank Herb for, for this year, for past years, and he's not retiring. He just wanted to say, <laughs> from canvassing, you know, that's, that happens every year, we get a new thing. But we just really wanted to say uh, thank you this seventh day of December for his countless hours of work on the canvassing board representing the Pinellas County Commissioners. We are grateful for, this, for your dedication and service. And, um, and certainly uh, Judge Carassus behind me has been, I said more than 10 years, uh, I think Dustin told me it was 11 years that he served as the chair of our canvassing board. And um, I couldn't be more proud to have worked alongside of him just a couple of elections, um, the one in 2016 in particular that we were there till three in the morning. He keeps, him, he keeps his wits about himself. He t obviously takes, uh, runs a very serious meeting. But we also, with that team of supervisor of election officials behind us, are just amazing um, uh, how they pull together and do such great work. And in a, in a day, in an era where there are lots of questions about election integrities, I just really am so overly impressed with our group here in Pinellas County. They just do an amazing job and led by our chair, the Honorable John Carassus, the seventh day of December, 2021, for your countless hours of work serving as a canvassing board chair for over 10 years. We are grateful for your dedication and service as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to let Dustin say just a couple of words, and then I'm going to turn it over to the two gentlemen to say just a couple of words, too. Dustin. Thank you very much, Commissioner. I'm here today on behalf of Supervisor Julie Marcus, who is at a meeting with the other supervisors across the state, but she wanted to express her gratitude to both the gentlemen who have served countless hours on the canvassing board. As many of you know as canvassing board members yourself, being a canvassing board member is a relentless task where you spend hours and days and weeks making sure that the election goes off without a hitch and that we do indeed have election integrity in Pinellas County. Mr. Polson has been on numerous canvassing boards throughout his time with us at the Supervisor of Elections Office. Um, he is very dedicated to making sure that every eligible vote is counted, that we are following Florida and federal law, and that the interests of Pinellas County voters are truly represented. Judge Carassus has been an amazing asset because in most counties across Florida, it's sort of the judge du jour is sitting on the canvassing board. For us, we have had incredible continuity. Thank you to you for your service. He is very dedicated to the law. He is disciplined and determined to get things right. And if you ask us, the staff at the Pinellas County Supervisor of Elections Office. The reason we conduct great elections is because we have great people dedicated to the process and getting it right. So thank you both very much for your work and we look forward to seeing you in the future and congratulations on your retirement from the canvassing board. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Well, as I look around the room, in the course of the last 45 years that I've been in this community working uh, in public service, I've worked with every one of you in some capacity. And uh, for you to trust me to be the alternate on the canvassing board is a big honor for me. And Jewel, I look forward to her phone calls because it keeps me out of the campaign business. So, <laughs> so I'm very appreciative. So uh, don't, don't stop calling me, please. <laughs> And thank you, I appreciate it so much. It's been a pleasure working with Herb. Thank you, Jewel, for everything that you provide, the legal advice to us. Uh, I was chairman um, as soon as we lost Judge Cadell. Uh, those of you that have been around for a while know he was an expert on election law. I had the, the pleasure of working with him um, as, as the alternate for years, and I took over the chairmanship about eight years ago. Uh, we went through many elections. I learned a lot. We've worked with just about everybody here in the room, I think. Uh, and only when you participate in those meetings do you really understand the, 
the, the importance of the work. A lot of people just look online now and see the election results and complain if they don't come out in a timely manner. But there's a lot of work before and after the election, as you all know. Uh, it's been really a pleasure being part of that. Dustin, thank you for the kind words. I'm not retiring as a judge. I'm just retiring from the canvassing board. Judge Jagger will take over my position as the chairman. Uh, he was an alternate, and he's going to be He's going to serve you all well. Thank you for the uh, privilege of serving Pinellas County in this capacity. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for being here today, and thank you for the other folks that came from the supervisor's office um, and all the work that you do on all of our behalf. Okay, let's get to the next item on the agenda is under citizens to be heard, and we have a few here. And uh, we will start with uh, David Lee, and then followed by uh, Velma. Oh, no, Tom Showalter, excuse me. Good afternoon, David. Sorry about that. I thought okay. I was going last. It's in the next room. Uh, David Lee, 4425 46th Avenue North. Um, Neary Park neighborhood and the Lelman CRA. And I'm just here, I want to tell you, I was, you know, thinking about where we were um, as a community back in January and then where we are now. And um, I'll tell you, what a huge 180 that we've done um, just in a short amount of time. And, you know, as I was thinking about it, I'm like, you know, what was it? It really wasn't one single thing, but I'll tell you a big part of it was um, all the staff that came down and met and interacted. Um, you know, like, for instance, the 46th Avenue uh, roadway project, uh, our community had concerns about that project. Um, not only did the staff from Public Works come down, um, they brought the engineer, uh, they walked the street, they actually got down into the ditches um, to see what we see and experience um, what we experience. Um, all that staff interaction um, has really, uh, you know, built momentum. Um, it's starting to build trust. Um, and it's really exciting uh, where we're headed. You know, the form-based code, um, that whole thing's been redone now. And um, it's a nice, light touch form-based code. Uh, it's something we can build on and expand. And not only do we have a new form-based code, the person who delivered it was the guy in charge of the form-based code. He came down, met everybody, um, Mr. Johnson, he hung out afterwards and answered questions. Um, and that's just been repeating over and over again, this rotating staff um, that's been coming down and spending time with us. Um, and you know, then I, I looked through this uh, stimulus funds list, um, and I, I'm telling you, I'm just gonna be more thrilled um, if some of this makes it through. And you know, just looking at this road, 46th Avenue, uh, roadway reconstruction. If you look at it closely, there's some magic words on there. Lillman Road and Curb and Gutter. <laughs> there it is. There it is. I mean, <laughs> what a what a gift uh, to our neighborhood. Um, really dialed in, and I just want to say how grateful um, I am to see this change, you know, happen. And it's just been really cool to be a part of it. Um, and, and watch it happen and watch it get better. It feels like a rubber band that's pulled all the way back and like it's about to get let go and it's, we're gonna be rolling. We've got this cool logo, everything. So uh, really exciting. So 
Yeah. Uh, thank you guys, and, and thanks to all the staff and yeah. attention that you've given us. Yeah, David, thank you. Appreciate your comments and also all your hard work on behalf of the residents. Okay, Tom, uh, Tom Showalter and then David Ballard Geddes, Jr. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Tom Showalter, and for 40 years, uh, I practiced dentistry at 1678 West Bay Drive. I now own that property. We've had it long enough with my partner that it's paid off, and the county has been wonderful to us the whole time. But there's a situation that has occurred now that doesn't affect me and my building as much as it does my neighbor. But to my north, um, at 35 Velma Drive, right off of West Bay Drive, um, there are the, the two that own that property have now lived for two years with a huge hole in their backyard. That hole has affected my property now and is starting to get near our foundation, so I'm worried on that part of it, but my biggest concern is that for two years, these two wonderful people tried to get something done. They got an attorney, and when I first looked over the fence to see what the problem was about six months ago, I called the city, I called the county, I called the neighboring business, and it's like a circle of point, people pointing their fingers at each other, but nobody wants to do anything. I talked to the county, I guess the gentleman I talked to in legal at the county is not there anymore, but uh, it's just really utterly ridiculous that somebody in government hasn't done something. It's not a big job. They've gotten two estimates. It's not a sinkhole. All it needs is a little bit of work, and I just wanted to be here to back them up because after two years, and this hole is it's four times as big as this podium, five feet deep, and it's all because drainage pipes were put in 35, 40 years ago, and the city of Largo doesn't want to claim them. The county didn't want to claim them. I knew the people that owned that park that lived in the house that they're now living in, they had lived there for 20 years and they left about 30 years ago. But it's just, to me, it doesn't seem fair that somebody in government, I, I don't know who's at fault, I don't care, but I, at this point, I guess it is the county that has claimed that they do have responsibility through their legal department. But I'm just here in support of them. And if it gets much further, you know, it's going to require that, that, that I get an attorney. And I don't have a love for attorneys, so I don't really want to get one. So I'm just asking if somebody can please listen to them. And they have the whole paperwork and an estimate and an okay. appraisal and all that. But really, I'm just here in support of them. So if you could please listen, it's something needs to be done there. So I'm, I'm, I'm assuming we have all his contact information. Yes, Mike. I, I don't know, but we were well aware of the case. Okay. So, okay. All right. Just yeah, to I talked sure. with uh, Keith Bentley, is who had my information. So. Okay. Great. Oh, okay. Thank you for being Thank here. Thank you today. all. And I yep. just some consideration yep. would be appreciated. Thank yep. you. Uh, David Ballard Geddes Jr. and then Greg Pound. Hi. Good afternoon, commissioners. David Ballard Geddes Jr. I live on Georgia Avenue in Palm Harbor. The, f the first sentence of Federalist Paper Number 1, Hamilton abridges into a new constitution. A total of three constitutions is revealed in Federalist Paper Number 59, seen as the former, the latter, and the last resort, seen as well in Federalist Paper 22, 34, 51, 78, and 81, three constitutions. Abraham Lincoln did not write the 14th Amendment. It's jurisdiction is found enumerated in Federalist Paper Number 39. Its jurisdiction is also found in Federalist Paper Number 14 and 23. But what Abraham Lincoln did do was to revise the 14th Amendment. He amended the 14th Amendment to include the except for participation in a rebellion clause, calling into question and denouncing the Book of Common Rebellion. 
rebellion, constitutionally nullifying such rebellion. Abraham Lincoln nullifying the Book of Common Rebellion and knowing that he would be assassinated for making such a constitutional nullification, he and an actor by the name of John Wilkes Booth staged his assassination and made an escape. The so-called body of John Wilkes Booth that was so badly burned and decomposed at autopsy, actual identification was really not possible. Abraham Lincoln's wife, well, she left the country and did not return until years later. Dr. Mudd, he was imprisoned on an island just off of Key West to live out his last days in paradise. The other four co-conspirators were hanged by the neck with bags over their heads to conceal their identity. Abraham Lincoln's assassination, just like 9-11, was an illusion but nullifying the water jurisdictions in the 14th Amendment. That was real. Thank you. Thank you, David. Uh, Greg Pound. And then Kathy Doxey. Thank you, Greg Pound, Largo, Florida. Um, I want to read the statement here. It says, we know that no one ever seizes power with the intention of relinquishing that. George Orwell wrote that. Um, the workshop you had this past week where the county commissioners want to exter they want to take their um, term limits and move them to 12 years. Okay, we already voted on it, on term limits, and you guys haven't abided by that. And, and now you want to go ahead. Um, Peterson wants to make it two-year vacation and, and um, um, Eggert wants to make it a four-year vacation. And so what we've got is massive fraud and corruption with our leadership. When this country started, the white people fought against the white people, the white oppressors. And so we've got a government now that's controlled by criminals. And you guys are, you, you, listen, when we have an illegal sheriff, you should have asked a judge up here. I've, I've taken it to this Florida Supreme Court trying to get, it, get justice out of this county. I ran against three attorneys from the sheriff's department, and they ran illegally. And so by all rights, that's the constitutional office. And you said to the judge about upholding the law. He's to uphold the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. That's what it's about. And so what we've got is we've got a major problem with corruption. I mean, it's just fraud and corruption, and you guys know it. And if the if American people don't wake up, it's, I mean, these people are not going to stop. The leadership we have in this county are not going to stop grabbing power. They refuse to relinquish the power. Their term limits were up. Karen Seals' term limits were up a long time ago. Been here, what, 20 years? And so you guys know what you're doing. And now you're going to go ahead and you're going to tighten the loose on the people. You're just, and, we, and you have no accountability. That's a problem. That's why term limits are to keep you accountable. Okay, and that's and our right to vote. I mean, and this is what we have. And so you guys are you guys are destroying our republic, and um, and the people need to stop it. These guys are going to try to get on the ballot this next election that they're going to be here for 12 years. See, and then they can come back in two more years and be here another 12 years. And 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 I mean, this voting thing that we have is a joke. This computer voting we have now is set up, and all you people will be back here, and we'll have the same problems. The money's being laundered, and, and, and I'm just saying that it's just a real sad situation. I ran for sheriff, and by all rights, you study the Constitution, those guys ran illegally. I was the only legal candidate in Pinellas County, and a lot of you people would be in big trouble if I was sheriff, because I would uphold the Constitution, and you guys would be all, you'd be in trouble. Okay, um, Kathy Doxey and then Laura Havlin. Good afternoon. First of all, I want to thank you for giving me the time to speak today. Yeah, make sure that microphone's down a little bit for you. That, and you I appreciate your time. Um, my name is Kathy Doxey, and together with my partner, Laura Havlin, we are the owners and the residents of our home, 35 Velma Drive in Pinellas County. I'm here today because our backyard is caving in. 
It's got a five foot diameter concrete Pinellas County storm water pipe that runs through a Pinellas County easement across our backyard and our property. Um, we did send a package with all the pictures and everything. The pictures don't even do it justice. It would probably be great if we could get someone to come out there and take a look at it so you could really see what we've been dealing with. We've also submitted a letter to the board with expert reports confirming that the problem is caused by the storm water pipe and estimating that the cost of further investigation will exceed $15,000, likely by a substantial amount. Importantly, that estimate is only for damages to our property. The same easement and storm water pipe has additionally caused substantial damages to immediately adjacent properties, both to the east and the south of our property. Also attached to our letter to the board is a detailed summary of our unsuccessful efforts over now more than a year and a half to get the county stormwater and claim staff to meaningfully respond, investigate, and provide a remedy since our original complaints and requests were submitted in March of 2020. Instead, the county has responded by initially insisting that the pipe is not owned by the county or that, if it is, that the county has no legal obligation to properly maintain its pipe or its easement or to prevent or repair damage caused to our property. In fact, in response to PRA request, emails between the county of the city of Largo showed that it, in response to our initial complaints, in March of 2020, the county stormwater staff solicited that the city of Largo to accept a transfer of easement by the county or the consent of the county to abandon the easement and the storm water pipe despite its continuing use and damage to our property. Only after we were forced to hire an attorney who filed a notice of claim letter with the county attorney was a claim adjuster finally appointed. Well, after reviewing the damage at our property and promising us the county would take care of the problem, the adjuster has essentially delayed and abusicated, claiming that it that there is no present leak in the pipe and offering a compromise of thirty five hundred dollars. Okay, thank you. Just if someone could please somebody in this place fix it. Uh, Laura Havlin, and then Rebecca Jensen. Oh, wait a minute, not Rebecca. Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my Hi name there. is Laura Havlin. I'm at 35 Velma Drive. And the way we found this hole in the backyard is I had fell into it up to my waist. It scared me to death. I've had nightmares since then. And um, we had people come out to look at it. Keith Bentley came out saying that it would definitely be taken care of. He has since left, and the problem is still in the backyard. It is a tremendous hazard and liability. You know, we pay our taxes, we maintain our property. We love the area, um, have done a lot to the yard, but we can't even have our family over or pets out in our, we've got two small pets that can't, it's all roped off because if they would get into it, obviously they would fall into it and we would lose them. Um, we're just asking if someone could come out and please take care of it, at least address the problem, don't put it, under the carpet or whatever is going on because it, it needs to be fixed and addressed. And it is an easement, so we can't even go out there and try to do anything with it. So if someone could come out, we would definitely appreciate it. Appreciate it. Thank you, Laura. Thank you. Okay, I have Rebecca Jensen down originally for citizens to be heard, but now it says item 41. So is that right? You wanna come up now or did you wanna wait? You can come up now if you want. Hi. Welcome. Hi. Hi, I'm Rebecca Jensen, City of St. Petersburg, 33713. I'm here to speak on item 41. Uh, the County Re Redistricting Board update. I'm here to ask the board as a citizen not to redistrict, not to remap. 
I want to refer to the November 3rd redistricting board meeting. Dr. Owen stated many times about how there hadn't been enough time to look over the maps. While Mrs. Ambrose spoke volumes for the areas of interest concerning the census, stating sufficient time wasn't allowed for the counting population, especially minority population, which is usually the last to be counted. The reasons were COVID and early time cutoff became an undercount of minorities and limited responses. As a citizen that is here to stand up for the areas of interest, I want to add that in these populations, the census isn't trusted. It comes off as invasive and confusing. Some of us have multi-ethnicities. The boxes to be checked are complicated. Mrs. Ambrose went on to state that the maps already in use are badly gerrymandered, but the population count isn't correct for new ones. There's got to be a better way. I asked the board to not redistrict until so. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, I think that's all I have for um, citizens to be heard that are here. And I think there is a, one online, David Waddell. Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Waddell, if you could raise your hand in the Zoom application to be unmuted for citizens to be heard. And Mr. Waddell, if you could please raise your hand in the Zoom application. All right, and once you're unmuted, if you could state, spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes, sir. David Waddell, D-A-V-I-D-W-A-D-D-E-L-L. -L. I'm here as a citizen and in, in my capacity as the president of the Pinellas Grove Hamlet Citizens Committee. Uh, brief mention to uh, duty, service, and country. Uh, Today is a day of courage, and I want to commend the board. You guys have gotten through another year. Barry, I was sorry I was a little hard on you there, uh, but I'd like to discuss that with you down the road. Uh, Commissioner Eggers, uh, fantastic job with the, uh, uh, I want to commend your leadership, and I want to touch on communication and teamwork. Uh, Barry, you've got 3,000 people there. Uh, these resources have to be directed and utilized. Uh, an example of what I saw today is uh, just terrible. Uh, I mean, I hold, hold all of you public servants in an honorable light, and it's been a tough year. And I don't have a lot of time left, but the results I want to see moving forward, uh, I want things getting better. This well-oiled machine is starting to not work with the harmony that it needs. And uh, again, Commissioner Eggers, thank you uh, for your leadership and your courage, especially on the term limits. Um, and uh, Commissioner Eggers, if we could definitely please keep the invocation and the pledge in place and uh, co-chair uh, Commissioner Long, I look forward to working with you on environmental issues, particularly in our area um, I just learned, Barry, I know you got a lot on your plate, but we've got two environmental departments, and I've been interacting with the county for 18 years. One is with BDRS, Business Development Review Service, and the other one is with Public Works. And I got to say, Kelly Levy, you keep swinging, because I know you stand for the right thing, and you've got a lot of courage, young lady. But this teamwork has got to happen. We need interdepartmental communication We've got folks up here with holes in their yard that are threatening to contact the risk management group, for God's sakes, and get Jewel involved in another lawsuit. I mean, when I see this, you know, I had uh, experience where one engineer sat across from the other, two different disciplines. One was electrical, one was mechanical. The mechanical guy was working on a part, right? And the other guy was working on a part, but neither of them talked. We didn't discover it until we were in the sandbox trying to put this together. And this has happened on a number of occasions. So everything needs to be scrutinized, all right? And in this sandbox, all right, if we're going to fail, fail fast. Don't drag this out. Either your plan works, you revise it, or you start over. We're not dragging this stuff out for 10 years. This affordable housing thing got screwed up that way. This environmental thing got screwed up. What we did was put the bones and the meat out there on the place for the developers on that environmental thing, and it failed us with the number four property in our neighborhood. 
That cannot happen again. Thank, so, thank you. History repeats itself. Thank you, David. Okay. Um, anybody else that I missed um, online for? Not for this okay. item. Okay. Um, we're moving on to consent agenda. We have items two through 26. Um, I had three items I just want to highlight. Obviously, everybody, if you get a chance, look through the um, consent agenda. There's a lot of items on there that need to be, you know, reviewed as well. I pull off, I've been trying to pull off the items that re re require, that have some dollars associated with it, uh, a contract dollars. So the first one are the human services. It's award of bid to FPG Florida <coughs> for indigent and unclaimed burial and cremation services to the tune of 2.475 million over five years. They were the, uh, the only bidder on that item. Under public works, there's award of bid to American <coughs> Empire Builders for the Oakwood Drive Bridge Replacement Project. Um, and uh, this project consists of removal of the existing bridge over Steph Stephanie's Channel and construction of a new bridge. The Small Business Enterprise Program commitment to this contract is about 10%. The contract is 3.3 million and it's over 460 days. And the last item under utilities, award of bid to TLC diversified for construction of the Keller Regional Treatment Polyphosphate Building Process upgrades of 1.746 million, um, and it should take about 365 days to do it. The small business enterprise commitment's about 17% of that contract. With that said, is there any item that any commissioner wants to pull? And if not, do I have a motion for approval? I move approval, Mr. Chair. Uh, Commissioner Seal on the motion. Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to the regular agenda, uh, un agenda under county administrator departments. First up, administrative services. Barry. Item number 27 is a purchase authorization for heavy and light duty vehicles. You can see the four different sources that we use to replace our uh, different types of vehicles. Uh, included within this are uh, six fully electric vehicles, three sedans and three um, vans, and also 24 electric golf carts. Uh, total not to exceed $5.6 million. Any questions by the commissioners? Mr. Chair. Yes, Commissioner Long. So uh, given our discussions that we have had Barry, with regard to resiliency and sustainability, and the great presentation that was made to us by our consultant. Why are we only having six electric vehicles included in this big, long list of purchases? Well, so as part of that implementation, the strategy is that we have to build up an infrastructure to support that. The other thing is that the, the electric vehicles simply are not available under cooperative contracts also. Uh, there's an infrastructure backlog there that as that supply chain catches up, we'll then also be able to build out our infrastructure, have them uh, have our mechanics and retooling necessary to support them. This allows us to, per to bring some online, get gain that experience while we're building out that long-term plan. Well, I, I think we could do better than six. Just my opinion. I mean, either we mean what we say or we don't. And we have to keep on pushing to get to where we want to be. And so how long, for example, is it going to take us to put the infrastructure in place? It's going to take a while to, for all these vehicles to come to us anyway, right? It, that's true, but we also have to put out charging stations. Um, you've encouraged us to go after grants and things like that to be able to augment that cost. Well, we're applying for those, but we have no idea how much grant money we're gonna receive to be able to build out that infrastructure. We've had conversations with Duke and their programs, um, and so we're continuing to work on that. But remember, we gave you a five-year plan, um, and that was just a couple of months ago. So it is gonna take some time, uh, but this allows us to get started um, and work on that plan while we're executing on the various phases. I think we can be a little more robust, and that's just my opinion. Um, and this is like, this is a lot of equipment that we're going to be stuck with. How, what's the life of this equipment going to be worth? Depends on the depends on the type of vehicle. Well, I'd just have to an have average. To. We're going to have oh, it for, for a, years. For a light duty vehicle, probably you know what, four years, five years. Uh -huh. 
Okay. Yeah, and I think uh, I'm sure we'll be hopefully continuing to monitor um, the prices that we're getting, you know, the cost. There's not a contract in place, but I know that we, we had recently some folks tell us that, you know, Detroit and, 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 and the likes are retooling and they are trying to come up with uh, additional volume of this to bring, drive these prices down. I, I'm, I'm not been out that, comparing prices, but I'm just assuming that right now that there's a significant price structure difference and that that will start to equalize. As, as, as that supply chain builds out, they'll yeah. be able to get on these competitive contracts. One of the problems is they're not on the competitive contract because they don't have the supply um, necessary for the demand, and so there's a yeah. there's a period there where it has to catch up. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Uh, yes, Commissioner Seal. Well, I agree with Commissioner Long, but I wonder whether um, we've always had a pretty aggressive replacement schedule, and given the price differential and the um, delay and the supply chain and so on, maybe it's worth waiting and holding on to these vehicles for another year and see what happens. I mean, some of them, you know, kind of reevaluate this and really um, just replace what's necessary. Just a thought. Okay. Mr. Chair? Not yet, Commissioner Long. That's a really good point that Commissioner Seal made. I mean, do we have to put this large of an order out there right now? I think we should be broadcasting what our intentions are so that people know. We're never going to get caught up to where we need to be if we just, you know, go at a snail's pace and we don't really push the envelope to try to speed it up. I mean, let me tell you something. The earth is not going to wait for us. And our kids and our grandkids are going to be stuck with the result. So this is the very least we can do is to try to do the best that we can do and be leaders in this arena. Commissioner, I don't know what, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. We, we, we laid out a, a five-year plan uh, and that five-year plan looked at both the availability, it also looked at the cost effectiveness of that, but it was also very intentional on where we put for instance, the, the trickle chargers, the, 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 the chargers that cost a few thousand dollars versus where we're investing and you have the rapid chargers and things like that. We're overlaying that with our space plan because we don't want to make investments of a place that we're going to leave. So we're trying to, trying to figure all that out and that was just a few months ago. So we still have ongoing um, vehicle demands and you know this is our, our normal replacement schedule. These will come around. When we start implementing and we start buying more as that supply chain catches up, it's gonna take us several years even to do the replacements. Um, and we're gonna to have to have an infrastructure available to support that. That is going to take some time. I see Joe standing back there. He could, you know, I'll, I'll let him speak if he, if he has anything more to add who is actually working on this. But Joe Laurel with Administrative Services. Barry's 100% correct. On top of that, the bulk of our fleet are, is, is heavy equipment and pickup trucks. Honestly, Commissioner, and, and we're with you 100%, we really are, and we have a plan going forward. There's only one manufacturer right now who's been making electric pickup trucks, and they're making 3,000 a year, so the economy of scale just is not there. We, the equipment that you see that we're replacing has to be replaced. It's worn out, it's way beyond its useful life. In fact, we have delayed a lot of replacements because of that because we, we do have a plan, a strategic plan. We're hoping one or more manufacturers, aside from Ford, start producing pickup trucks because then we can actually have competition to buy from. Right now, between the supply chain concerns, the chip shortage and everything else, it's really created a backlog in orders and it's not just us, it's pretty universal throughout the industry. So it's pretty tough right now, it really is. And I, if I may, Mr. Chair, I understand that, Joe, and I'm not trying to give everybody a hard time, oh, no, we but I don't have my head in the sand either. And I know that given where the whole world is going on these issues, that there's no question in my mind that that supply chain will even out. They will start production again. Uh, <clears throat> because as you and I and everyone both know, it's, it's all about the money. And it's going to put a lot of people to work and help the economy grow at the same time. So what we're really looking for, what I'm really looking for, is a change in the culture of how we think 
about these issues that are so critical to our survival. This isn't just a, I mean, I, I, I can't support this because I just think it's contrary to everything we need to be doing. I'm sorry. Yeah, Joe, I think your comment on, on the fact that there is a backlog of product is one thing, but the fact that they're not tooled enough yet to, to create the number of vehicles, forget the backlog. Mm -hmm. Just that that's what Detroit's doing. They're retooling, and in the next three to five years, I think they're, they're seeing that the market is heading in a different direction more Absolutely. towards electric vehicles. And I think it's gonna be a natural evolvement into that product line and that availability. And frankly, I think we ought to be cognizant of the tax dollars that we're using in the meantime. And, and you know, if the next five or six years comes and goes, you know, these trucks that we're now replacing will be up again. And hopefully by then there'll be a different, a different story. Um, but in any event, um, appreciate your comments. Appreciate your comments as well. Anybody else? Okay, thank you. Um, I don't think I got a motion on this. You move approval? Okay. Yep. Commissioner Peters on the motion, Commissioner Gerard on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Uh, the motion passes six to one. Okay, moving on to item 28 under airport. Item number 28 is a ranking of firms and an agreement with Avcon for professional engineering design uh, services. This is for the air code taxiways. Uh, the design amount is um, $1.5 million. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gerard. I didn't hear the second, I'm sorry. Second. Sorry about that. Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 29, under airport. This is ranking of firms with Michael Baker International for engineering services for the cargo apron reconstruction and replacement of runway 9-27. Um, again, the engineering amount is $1.8 million. Uh, Commissioner Seal. I do have a question. I noticed that Avcon is the second ranked. Would it not make sense you're doing the new Airco taxiways, and this is for replacement of runway 927 to have one engineer who's mm -hmm. looking at it. I mean, I, and kind of redesigning them together and designing them together. I'm, it's, Tom, I don't Thomas really Zero. know the firm Avcon. I'm just yeah. no, that's a good thinking question. of practicality. Yeah, good question. And then I know Michael Baker has done a lot of engineering for us over many years. Yeah, they have. So. Uh, Tom Jewsbury, airport director. Yeah, these are in fact two separate projects and there's also two separate funding sources. Uh, the one for the Airco taxiway connectivity that allow the future development of Airco, um, that's actually on the separate side of the airfield. These are different projects. Uh, the other one for the t uh, runway conversion is just that replaces a taxiway but with the runway on the west side of the airfield and also um, redevelops what used to be referred to as the cargo apron. So the comment about combining engineering services for the two projects is, did they, I, since they were two separate projects, I assume that they bid on different, both. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that's correct. And I, I mentioned as far as two uh, separate funding sources, that's true, especially with the, uh, the runway conversion. Uh, the majority of that is coming from FDOT under a CIS grant, where the other one we're using entitlement funding from the FAA. I'm, not, I'm still not quite sure the connection between why they couldn't be combined. I mean, I, I yeah. they are they're completely two separate projects altogether. One's for uh, development of new taxiways, the other understand. one's associated with uh, uh, replacing the apron and also converting a runway to a taxiway. So they are completely in So there was no thought that the synergy between having two do one, two, one company do two projects um, d wouldn't make any sense. It, it didn't for this project, no. Okay, all right. Okay, um, any other questions while we have Tom here? Good to see you, Tom. Likewise. Right, cool. Okay, thank you. And we, um, do, no, do we have a motion on this? No. Commissioner Justice on the motion, Commissioner Gerard on the second. All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, moving on to Convention and Visitors Bureau, item number 30. 
This is an agreement with Kloss Media Services for International Sales and Public Relations representative, uh, Representation Services in Central um, Europe. Uh, $302,000 for a five-year contract, $1.5 million. Um, if, before we take these two on, could we just have Steve come up Absolutely. and maybe talk a little bit about this latest changes that are going on? I mean, we, we opened up markets and just kind of get his take on what's going on out there. Um, it's hard to crystal ball this too much, I know, but... Uh, sure. Hi, Steve. Welcome. Good. Good uh, afternoon, Mr. Chair. Uh, I am going to assume that you mean what's happening with international travel. Yes, I, exactly. Okay. And it's Steve Hayes. He's our director. We, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Steve Hayes, uh, visit St. Pete Clearwater. So internationally, everyone knows, or hopefully everyone knows, November 8th, um, the uh, U.S. administration opened up the borders for our international travelers, which opened it up to our Canadians, our friends from Europe, really acro across, the, uh, across the world. Um, and I think we saw some, some very good results starting off, and then this variant shows up, and now all of a sudden, depending on what country and what's happening there, we're starting to hear um, of some hesitancy about traveling. I was uh, talking with the folks from the UK today, and even in the UK, um, they're looking at what kind of restrictions they may have for people traveling even within the UK. How does that translate to people that are coming into the United States? Um, on that call as well, because one of the questions we had was if I am an international traveler and I'm here and I need to get back home and you've got to have a test that was within 36 hours, um, are you able to get that done? And thankfully here in Pinellas County, we have a number of outlets that we're able to provide to say, if you're a visitor here, you're able to get that test in these locations to be able to head back to, to your home country. So again, um, crystal ball is not crystal. Um, but, you know, again, at least the borders are open and we haven't heard of anybody yet closing it and saying they're not going to let their citizens travel to the United States. Uh, Steve, how do these contracts work if for some reason it does get shut down? Um, you know, I, I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't think that's going to happen. I hope that's not going to happen. Things are starting to move and that's great. If it does, are these contracts um, adjustable? There, there's actually a cancellation cl uh, okay. clause in there. I think every contract that the, the county has has something built in in that case. Yeah. So again, it depends, you know, if it's gonna be a complete shutdown, there's nothing gonna be happening, and you know, you know, we need to say, hey, we need to stop our services. That's one direction, or, you know, it's a something temporary that's happening, and then we still need to have somebody there providing the ground information of what's happening there versus what we might be hearing here in the okay. United States. Fair enough. I mean, that's 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 an important point. Uh, question. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Peters. Uh, thank you, and I don't know if you have the answer to this, but um, so when I went to Costa Rica a couple months ago, and then Ecuador, um, it was always within 72 hours that you have a test. You had to have a test to get back in the United States, and now they're saying 24 hours. Um, there's a couple things I want to make about that. First off, um, when I went from California to Hawaii, it took 48 hours to get the results. When I went to Central America and South America, coming back home, it only took, God, only three hours to get the results. Um, and so, um, I, you know, in our country it took 48 hours, but in other countries it only took me two hours. So I guess my question is, um, hopefully CVS and Walgreens and all those places are doing it in a couple hours now to get the results, but if I'm coming from another country and I'm worried that I have to do it within 24 hours and I'm not gonna get the results because everything's done digitally, um, first off, that gives me a little fear. So is there anything in our marketing that we can include to say in Florida um, that 24-hour you know, tests are available, there are numerous places that you can get these tests so that you can kind of eliminate that fear? Um, and I will tell you, there's a lot of fear because everybody I traveled with was really worried we wouldn't get it in time, and what do you think? And that was with the three-day. I think the, the one-day is is warranting um, a little more escalated fear. Um, so, you know, if we can do something to kind of reassure them and hopefully um, our partners in the community are gonna, are gonna expedite those results quickly um, so that they don't have a problem getting back into their, you know, back into this country or not or, or whatever. But, you know, I don't know if they have to have it going into their country, the same kind of thing, if it's a three day or a 24 hour, 
Um, but for them coming here, I don't know, that's evidently up to their countries, but I can tell you in Central and South America, I got those results within hours. So I, I just don't know, but if there's a way that we can, in our marketing, include that, um, if they need to get back into their country on a rapid test or something like that, that we have many services available for that to happen. Um, and maybe allevi alleviate some of that fear, because I think there's gonna be a lot of anxiety about it. Thank you uh, for that comment. And actually, what I'll do is go back to the staff member that has the list of the places where you can get the testing done and see if there is a time on that, whether it's I get results in an hour, 24 hours, a day, wh whatever it, it ends up being. Interestingly enough, having traveled internationally here recently as well, I actually had my, my results in an hour. So it, I think it depends on who's doing it and in what country you're in. Yeah. Um, but I was still worried, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, th you know, when it was a three-day thing, I don't think, you know, you do it that three days out, you're not so worried. But this 24-hour thing is worrisome. Um, and that's just to get back in this country. I don't know what it is to leave this country. Um, but I think if we let them know, that would help. I think CVS, I got mine back in an hour when I needed it to leave this country. Um, but I just, you know, so, so if we can at least... I think with CVS it was like 45 minutes or an hour. And so as long as we have that kind of turnaround, I think we need to include that in our advertising so it can relieve some anxiety about people you know, leaving. Okay. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Peters. Any other questions for Steve? I mean, uh, you're kind of up here for the next two items, but um, anything unique to either one of the contracts or that uh, we need to be aware of uh, before we let you? No, I, I would just, the one thing I would, would say on this is that, you know, part of it is that we're combining our PR and sales together, which is actually provides a savings off of uh, both agreements. And that's again, so that we have everyone on the same page, all going in, in the same direction and we get to save resources as well. Okay. And uh, item 30 is for um, 1.5 million over five years with uh, Kloss Media for services in Central Europe, and item 31 is for services in UK, Ireland, and Scandinavia. That's a $1.83 million contract um, over five years. So they're two separate. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Seal, thank you. And actually on both of them, I was curious if um, who it was replacing, like in 30, it looks like we're replacing Marion Wolf. Yeah, so in the German... Is, is Kaus new? Uh, Kaus has previously handled PR for PR. us in okay. the German market, mm -hmm. uh, but on the sales side, they also have a sales division, and they bid, uh, they were one of the bidders along with uh, uh, Marion, who, who had the uh, agreement. Uh, that was the two that bid on the Western Europe. Okay, and then how about 31? With and Brewster? then for the UK, that was uh, Vanessa. Um, yeah. And Vanessa actually closed her business okay. um, with uh, the, with got probably a couple months in, actually three or four months into to, to COVID. Um, and she has since gotten out of the business completely. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Steve. Um, I guess we should take these separately. So the item number 30 is the ad agreement with Klaus Media uh, for services, sales and public relations in Central Europe for 1.5 million over five years. I have a motion for <coughs> approval. approval. Commissioner, yeah. Commissioner Gerard on the motion, Commissioner Long on the second. All in favor say aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And item 31 is for contract with Rooster Creative doing business as Rooster for international sales and public relations in UK, Ireland, and Scandinavia for a five year uh, not to exceed $1.83 million. Do I have a motion? Uh, Commissioner Seal on the motion, Sorry. Commissioner Peters on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. On to item 32. It's a Fair. local Fair. arts agency funding agreement with Creative Pinellas. Uh, this total commitment's $978,000. Um, and you can see the breakdown from the three different sources of funds. Yeah, and for those who might be listening, that's about seven hundred, almost eight hundred thousand from the tourist development tax fund, one hundred forty-five thousand from the general fund, and thirty-six thousand from the transportation trust fund for the uh, contract for this coming year. A motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Peters. Any other questions, comments? All in favor, say aye. 
Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. On to management and budget, item 33, uh, Barry. Item 33, we ask that this item be pulled from the agenda. There was a problem with the resolution, just the wording, so they worked with the clerk's office and want to bring it back next month. Okay. Do we need any action on that, Jewel, or are we okay just letting it go? Okay, thank you. Okay, item 34 under public works. This is a hazard mitigation grant um, program application with the Florida Department of Environmental Management uh, to re for the replacement and hardening of span wire support traffic signal signals and mast arm traffic signals. The total grant request is for $4.3 million. It requires a 25% local match. Um, and, um, there, and so this would be a total of $5.8 million if approved. Okay, any questions on this item? Do I have a motion, please? Commissioner Seal on the motion, Commissioner Gerard on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 35. This is a resolution providing authority for use of golf carts within the unincorporated Bardmore North community. Um, they have uh, worked with staff and meet all the statutory requirements. Any questions? Motion by Commissioner Flowers. Second by Commissioner Gerard. Any, no, no other questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. On to safety and emergency services, item 36, Barry. This is a renewal of certificates of public convenience and necessity for advanced life support um, providers. Uh, they're listed within your packet and uh, there's a lot, so. So any questions for Barry <laughs> on uh, Commissioner Seal on the motion for approval and Commissioner Long on the second? All in favor say aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on to authorities, boards, constitutional officers, and councils. First, under the uh, clerk of the court. This is a resolution amending the county's investment policy. Um, amend the county's investment policy for changes recommended by the investment committee. Uh, these are minor changes um, proportionately, so we recommend approval. Okay. Any questions for Barry? Do I have a motion, please? Commissioner Long on the motion, Commissioner Gerard on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. On to Emergency Medical Services Authority. Item 38 is a reappointment of the Emergency Medical Services Medical Control Board. Um, reappointment of Dr. Jennifer Pearson. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Now we go to county attorney. You have a couple items here tonight. Those Under up. item number 39, uh, you will see on this item, there is not a strong recommendation to take action uh, either way. However, we brought this matter forward for your consideration. This would be an additional lawsuit uh, related to opioids. This is a marketing company. Uh, I did get the opportunity to speak with some of you to just give some background on this, but I, I put this up for your consideration again. Uh, no recommendation from the county attorney's office on moving forward one way or another. Uh, the board can choose to move forward, or if you take no action, we would obviously not, we would not authorize outside counsel to file an action. Okay. Any questions? Um, any motion for no action or? Does that mean? Again, with no action, we will not be authorizing outside counsel to move forward. Okay. So now, we, don't, we don't need an official motion or anything? We do not. Okay, great. We do not. Um, under item number 40, we do want you to take action. This is a resolution that confirms our participation in the Pinellas County Opioid Task Force and adoption of the Pinellas County Opioid Task Force Strategic Plan. This is an item that we definitely recommend approval on in order to uh, establish Pinellas County as a qualified county uh, for purposes of participation in the settlement with the state of Florida and the various defendants. Okay. Motion by Commissioner Peters, second by Commissioner Flowers. Are there any questions, comments? Yes, Commissioner Long. I'm going to support it, but I do not appreciate the, the um, state of Florida usurping our litigation. We're the, ones that sp we're the ones that spent the money and we're the ones that should get it back. 
especially because we have both Pinellas and Pasco that the medical examiner uh, works for. Well, that's it. Okay. Any other comments? Um, so we had a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 41. Under item number 41, we do have a couple of items here uh, for your consideration. Um, I think we'll go ahead and take up redistricting. I know that we have our consultant, Kurt Spitzer, available to go over uh, the maps. Um, you all got a follow-up email from Mr. Spitzer subsequent to your work session last week where he forwarded, uh, based on the commission's discussion, the three maps that you all indicated to move forward with, two for consideration in regard to your single member districts and just one map for consideration uh, for your at-large districts. Um, I did uh, forward an email to each of you earlier with some suggested language for a motion. The point there being to capture authorizing staff to undertake some of the follow-up activities that we need uh, to accomplish subsequent to your action. Uh, and I will turn this over to Mr. Spitzer. Welcome. Good to have you with us again, Kurt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as the county attorney said, uh, at your last work session meeting, you considered, uh, we discussed seven maps that came uh, before you. Um, some were the recommendations of the redistricting board. Others were at request of individual uh, commissioners. Concerning um, some of the recommendations of the redistricting board, the redistricting board uh, recommended maps that included uh, housekeeping, technical changes, uh, and some minor, what I would call policy changes. And those fell into two different categories. And if you can see this map of the at-large districts here, um, for the at-large districts using the current boundaries, because of changes in the shapes of census blocks that were made by the Bureau of the Census, there were four census blocks that were split by current district boundaries. And here's an example of one uh, here in this area. And so um, what the redistricting board had recommended was that the boundary of this area uh, encompass this block so that this block is not uh, split by a district boundary and that we do not need to go through uh, an exercise to make calculations as to how many people are really in this half of this block and how many are in this half. And there are other areas too, some very small minor areas uh, with the at-large uh, plans. So that was uh, one change. There were changes similar to this with both, with also with the uh, single member district areas. There's only two though in the case of single member districts. Here is one block that's split between district five and six. And then moving up north, there was a block whose shape changed and so there were parts of this block that were split between districts uh, four and five and so for in both the single member and the at-large plans the recommendation of the redistricting board was to uh, change the the uh, boundaries of the uh, residence areas or the single member district areas so that they follow uh, block uh, boundaries that i think is clearly a, some, some technical changes. Uh, and so then beyond that, as relates to the at-large residence areas, Commissioner Justice had uh, made this or requested this recommendation, which would move all of Western St. Pete into District 3 so that uh, the city of St. Petersburg would be completely contained within District 3. Uh, if you do that, then this little housekeeping change and also this one here becomes moot because the boundary is nowhere near those two uh, areas. And so this is the 
recommendation alternative three which would change the boundaries between district one and district three of the residence areas for the at large districts we separately included a table of statistics that are really just a little bit easier to read than this the statistics on each map and as you can see the point spread between the largest and the smallest district residence district in the at-large plan is right around three percentage points and that's a very very good spread in terms of deviations you don't run into a problem until you get close to nine or ten percentage points so you're well within the district area the tolerance is there with regard to the single member plans there are two that are in your packet today one seeks to move the this area of district five north of Enterprise Road from district five into district four and moves Clearwater Beach and adjacent areas from district four into district five in addition to those changes this plan and also the other single member district plan makes adjustments to district boundaries between five and six and also between six and seven so that the cities of Largo, Seminole, and Pinellas Park are not split by the boundary between district five and six and or the boundary between district six and seven and these changes again are included in both of the options with regard to single member districts under this option there is a deviation between the smallest and the largest district of just under four and a half percentage points the other alternative concerning single member district plans is basic is identical to the first alternative with regard to the boundaries between districts five and six and six and seven it also moves the city of Clearwater Beach the city I'm sorry the Clearwater Beach area into the city of Clearwater area in district five but it continues the east-west boundary between districts four and five along Sunset Point Road making this a straighter line in this area here and moves all of this area north of Sunset Point from district five into district four this particular option has a deviation of 4.6 percentage points and so they're all well within acceptable tolerances and again the the single member district plans are identical to one another except for the differences between the boundaries between four and five the the second plan runs along Sunset Point the first plan runs along Enterprise Road and so I'd be happy to answer any questions that the Commission might have mr. chairman okay thank you I'm just looking at two and three and looking or excuse me one and two just to see what the pop the total population is in either case it looks like a cup that looks like a couple of hundred people right the net a few it's they're very very similar in terms of populations and deviations okay okay all right okay any questions for 
Kurt. Okay, um, Jewel, do you do you think we ought to take this as a just a package to make a recommendation uh, on the at large first, and then then look at the you know the single members? Uh, yeah, I, I recommend that you vote have two different votes: okay. one for the at large map and one for the single member map. Okay, Commissioner Justice. I don't have a question. I have a motion. When you're ready. Okay, Commissioner Peters, did you have a question? I was make a motion as well. Do you have a question, Commissioner? Yes, go ahead. Um, I think it was Microphone. I think it was council member, I mean, Commissioner Karen Seal that talked about um, the little sh shootout for Enterprise Road. Was that you? Mm -hmm. um, and someone gave me a call today uh, questioning just that little small cutout um, moving that into District 4 instead of 5. Um, it's, it's, really, it's a really small slither. If you take um, Proposal 3. I'm sorry, um, Alternative 1 or 2? Single, I'm sorry, Single Member Districts, uh, RB Proposal 3. RB Proposal 3. I'm looking at what oh. we have. All right, I was just looking at what we had, he, what he sent us. Let me go back. Oh, I'm sorry, because I'm looking at what's in our packet on the. Go ahead. Do you have a... We can narrow it down to three or four. Okay. Yeah, we can narrow it On the single member districts, we are narrowed down to alternative one and alternative two yeah. during Thursday's workshop. So, I mean, it, you know, it doesn't me mean we can't readdress it, but I mean, sure. we, we had taken mm -hmm. that. No, that's okay. I'll, yes. I'll go over to. Alternative one and alternative. Oops, sorry. When you said that little part, uh, Commissioner, did you mean the part below Sunset Point that kind of diagonals yes. a little bit? Yes. Okay. So the idea was to put that one on Sunset Point and then go up to Enterprise. Is that what you heard, or? Well, no. The the concern was that they just wanted to remain in their current. They wanted to continue to be represented in their current uh, district, if possible. Okay. Um, and it was just, I got one phone call. I didn't okay. get several, just yep. okay. one phone call. And I did um, tell them that I would bring that up today because I thought that we had had some conversation here when we were talking about it through our workshop about, you know, mm -hmm. why that small little piece was being moved, so. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Commissioner Flowers. Um, any other, yes, Commissioner Seal. Well, I guess in response, I pulled out the memo that we originally had from Kurt about the redistricting um, criteria. And I guess I wanted to make the point that um, if you look at the, over the years, District 5 has probably been changed more than any other district since 1990, to, since 2000. And one of the common criteria is to recognize the existing district boundaries the boundaries of the new districts may seek to retain their existing boundaries to the extent possible. The changes that are being proposed are pretty big. You're changing to Clearwater Beach and then you're taking out that whole area of countryside that has been in District 5 since 2000. So, you know, I guess I understand the Clearwater Beach. Um, the other criteria was to avoid splitting communities of interest and then the important thing in the criteria in the Pinellas Charter was where feasible redistricting plans shall consider utilizing municipal boundaries and keep the unincorporated areas of the county together. If you move down to Sunset Point Road, you will take out a large part of unincorporated area of Clearwater, which is Lake Chautauqua. And, um, you know, I would prefer to keep the district boundaries as, as, as close to what they have been all these years, again, using common restrict, redistricting criteria. Um, but I can live with alternative one, which is moving it to Enterprise Road. You'll still retain a good part of the unincorporated county, plus you'll also keep part of countryside, which is in the city of Clearwater. So um, that would be my, um, my preference, please. Alternative one. Alternative one. Mm -hmm. okay. Commissioner Gerard. 
just a question for uh, Commissioner Flowers. Did you find the map that we're looking at for alternative one? Is it that little nip at the very top near at, at Enterprise? Yeah, I don't, do we have any idea why that was there in the first place? What's that? I What's believe that? that's part of the city of Safety Harbor. That oh, little, okay. that, yeah, that little piece, it, it, was it was incorporated into Safety Harbor. Oh, oh okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay, that makes sense then. I think I actually asked that question at our uh, former meeting. Yeah. No. So, yeah. And I can't remember. There's not too many houses because that's a real commercial. It's actually co all commercial. It's all commercial corner. So I. Don't, right there. Yeah. yeah. I'm quite right. familiar with there. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I, I frequent there a lot too. So. Um, yeah. Um, any other questions? Okay. Yeah, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Chairman. I would move that for the at-large districts, we adopt the redistricting proposal identified as alternative at-large alternative three, and that we authorize staff to comply with all statutory notice and advertising requirements. Okay, a motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Peters. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, those the single member district, uh, excuse me, the at-large district, uh, let me make sure I say this correctly, alternative three, uh, passes unanimously. Commissioner Seal. Yes, I make a motion that I move that for the single member district four and five, or the, uh, four, five, six, and seven districts, we adopt the redistricting proposal identified as alternative one, and that we authorize staff to comply with all statutory notice and advertising requirements. Okay. I have a motion. And a Okay, that's fine, no problem. I have a motion and a second by Commissioner Justice. Um, Commissioner Peters. Yeah, only because, um, so also in the guidelines, which you didn't mention, is that it says that you have to be compact, as compact as possible, and that you can use major roads as boundaries. Um, and so by taking in Clearwater Beach, um, that's taken a large population away from District 4, and by adding that countryside area, it kind of evens it out and levels it out. And then by keeping the countryside area, you're taking um, all of the population of Clearwater Beach away and leaving very little to add to District 4. Um, granted, within, we're within that parameter, um, but I still think that doing the compact is what fits constitutionally and within our charter. Um, and I'm, you know, I don't know that Clearwater Beach residents were complaining because they weren't in their, you know, District 5. Um, I still contend that most people have no idea what district they're in unless we specifically tell them. I can't tell you how many people from Clearwater and Safety Harbor said they voted for me um, when <laughs> they aren't in my district. Um, and so, you know, I would contend that we're very, very, very limited and few people would know what district they live in. And I really believe that we should fit within the constitutionality and the um, charter rules of, about the compactness because I really like that. Um, and that you use a major <coughs> corridor, corridor or roadway as the boundaries. And Sunset Point is a perfect corridor. I don't, I don't know that you could draw that much better than the way um, the committee presented this um, alternative to. Um, I understand, Karen, you're, you're passionate about it, but I just think that alternative two fits the guidelines much better. Um, with more reasons, with more different stipulations. Um, and so, so I would not support the motion um, and, and would hopefully uh, that you all would agree and stick with the compactness because it really fits so much better with the Constitution and with the Charter. I just want to make a point that Clearwater, and under, under Alternative 1, Clearwater Beach does move into District 5. Yeah. So they both under both scenarios. Oh, under both scenarios, yeah. just for yeah. um, the record. Right. Well, just for clarification, what I said is by that moving down there, um, District Five gains that entire population, um, and in the proposal that you're making, you're keeping the vast majority of countryside, and so therefore there wasn't a swap. So District Four doesn't gain the population that's equitable. Where if you if you give them that countryside part, then it's almost like an even swap with Clearwater Beach versus the countryside. And so it's, it's you know, it, it's, it's just a difference in, in that population swap. Um, it's as though you're taking in, you know, all of Clearwater Beach, but not, not adjusting so that District 4 gets more population. Well, let me, let me Kurt, just so I'm clear here, because there's the, the conversation going on. 
under alternative uh, one, um, I just wanna make sure I'm clear, under alternative one, district four loses less people, correct? That's correct. That's correct. Okay, that, number one. And number, and the second thing is, is that under alternative one, all of Clearwater is captured in District 5 except the Northern Peace. So we, we've done our best. You know, I think one of the things that you said, Kurt, was that it's hard to get all of Clearwater and all of St. Pete in one. But I think by doing Alternative 1, you're capturing um, a great deal, if not, well, a great deal, almost all of Clearwater um, by going up to Enterprise and just leaving <coughs> that, that countryside really north of Enterprise into District 4. So you're doing our best to try to try to give as, as much of Clearwater in District 5. So I, mean, I, I understand both both arguments, but I certainly, I, I kind of lean towards that alternative one myself, but. This is uh, alternative one uh, with municipal boundaries behind it. So you can see where the unincorporated area is and the incorporated area in the in city of Clearwater uh, area. This is alternative two. Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's like, it's a, t it's, it's very, it's very close, isn't it? I mean, you're, you're gaining, you're gaining and losing Clearwater with that Sunset Point line um, going straight across. You're gaining a little bit south of Sunset Point, and they're losing some, obviously north of Sunset Point. So, but the net, the net effect is to give a little bit less of a drop, if you will, in population for District Four under Alternative One. Either way, we can't capture all of Clearwater. So, you can, you cannot. Okay, um, any other conversation? We have a motion and a second for alternative one. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, that motion carries six to one. <clears throat> so um, that also has the stipulation of, of granting staff the the authority to move forward in the directions that they need to. Uh, Kurt, is there anything else that you think that we need to take on? We obviously had the deadline by the end of this calendar year. Um, there was a comment made early on, I don't know if you were here by one of our residents that was a little bit concerned about um, some, of the, you know, some of the issues that she raised. I don't wanna paraphrase those issues, but um, from a time standpoint, Maybe you could speak just generally about that, uh, the direction we had because of the late arrival of the census. Right, I, I think the, you know, the, this, this census was unusual in, in that we primarily because of the, the pandemic and, and the effects that it had on uh, collecting data and it was, it did arrive almost five months late, but it, it is, uh, it's been received now for a few months. Um, uh, I, I think that uh, it's presumed to be correct. We, we, we assume that, that the data from the Census Bureau is, is accurate. Um, if, if there are you know, some, some gross uh, errors that are discovered uh, a year or two down the road, you always have the option of, of adjusting your boundaries during an odd numbered uh, year. Uh, but I, I think that, uh, and there is the option too, to make some adjustments to the 2020 data uh, based on good demographic uh, principles on, on your own. But, but the, the, the window to do that for this year has come and gone uh, months ago now. There's, there's really no, no way to make adjustments now to this data. Um, I think, uh, you know, if your, your options, if, if someone feels strongly about 
that there, that there's some sort of a flaw with the data that they can demonstrate to us that there's a, a problem with it. Um, you know, I think you're, as we said before, the, the data, uh, the, the deviations of your current districts are within acceptable tolerances, of, you know, the, but uh, you have this opportunity now to make some uh, largely housekeeping and technical changes, and then the, the change to the Clearwater Beach and Enterprise area, um, I, I would suggest that you move ahead with that and then wait and see if there's some, uh, some well-documented uh, uh, corrections that need to be made to the census data at some point in the future, and if necessary, you can act on it at that time. Um, and Kurt, real quickly, how would that transpire if those if those kinds of change would that information just come to us at the county and then then we would have to determine a course of action at that point? I think we, we'd see we, we'd watch other other areas of the country, other other jurisdictions, uh, uh, see if there's some you know global. Uh, uh, recommended corrections that the Bureau of the Census wants to make, uh, you, you could do that um, and, and then act upon that yourself. Um, or if there's some other uh, source, uh, uh, if the, the Bureau of Economic and Business Research at the University of Florida, you know, which is the Florida legislature and, and state government contracts with that uh, Bureau to provide all of its population information and demographic projections. If they say there's, there's a, you know, clearly there's there's some sort of an error here, and and we recommend the following changes, then you could look at that too. Okay, all right, and I just wanted to take one final uh, opportunity to thank our redistricting commission uh, for the work that they did, and as you said, it was a very compressed time frame, um, and uh, I think you know. It, the, the good news for Pinellas County is, is that our growth seemed to be pretty evenly distributed across the county. So we didn't have a, a, a lot of big changes that other counties that have high growth going on might have had. Uh, but nonetheless, I wanted to thank that group um, and, uh, and you, Kurt, um, and uh, for the work that you've done to get us to this point. I think your point is well taken. We can make adjustments in odd numbered years going forward if something comes to our attention. So. Anything else? Yes, Commissioner Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I just wanted to, uh, along with our, our board, I wanted to add my thanks to uh, the staff that supported it, um, uh, Kevin and Brian and our attorney's office and everyone. And, um, and the, 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 you mentioned the advisory board. Uh, I would say almost every single one was a very non-political person and we're just doing it for community service and they, I think they learned a lot about uh, uh, how we operate and how we're structured. And uh, we appreciate the time that they put in. Um, and certainly compared to other counties that are going through, uh, this was a much smoother yeah. uh, process. Agreed. Anything else? Okay, you have one more item for us. I do. Also under uh, the county attorney reports, you'll see the draft policy that we've talked about a time or two um, previous to today that would set forth a policy for the commission in regard to uh, commissioners appearing virtually uh, at county commission meetings or workshops. Um, you know that we've spoken about this a couple times. What I would bring to your attention, um, just a couple of items of note that are set forth in the policy. Uh, this really largely reduces to writing what has been your practice. Uh, I will say one, I guess, minimal change in here is that we're saying that virtual attendance would require both audio and visual interaction. Prior to the pandemic, when we all became used to Zoom and, and Teams, uh, commissioners would largely call in over the phone, but this policy would memorialize that such, a, um, such participation would require both audio and visual interaction. Uh, it obviously sets forth that for action to be taken, a quorum of the board must be physically present here uh, in person. Um, and then I'll just direct your attention to some of the uh, findings that we set forth for the commission to consider when entertaining a request from one of your fellow commissioners to appear virtually. What we've stated is that the commissioner attending virtually would be incapacitated due to illness or injury or hindered by extraordinary circumstances. 
uh, that being a legislative determination to be made by this board when considering such a request. Uh, but this policy really is here for your consideration today. Uh, you can adopt it, you can choose to do nothing and continue proceeding as you are, but this does, um, I think, give some certainty as to how you all are gonna approach these types of requests and uh, hopefully gets everybody on the same page. Okay. Thank you, Jewel. Um, any questions on the policy that's been presented? Yes, Commissioner Long. I guess I like a little clarity on what is broken with the way in which we've been conducting ourselves to begin with. Just asking. Nothing's broken and like I said, this really just reduces to writing largely what you all have been doing. Uh, my goal in bringing this forward to you all is we have seen uh, greater, my understanding is we have seen greater participation on other collegial bodies within the county virtually uh, for reasons that were um, not necessarily the reasons that you all have condoned in the past. So for the many, many years I've been uh, sitting with the board or watching board meetings, you all have primarily restricted virtual attendance by your colleagues to, um, to health issues. And the reason why I brought this forward initially was to give you all an opportunity to discuss if you wished to change that and perhaps loosen the way that you might look at virtual attendance. Uh, but through a couple of discussions that the board has had, you all really decided to stick with um, your past practice and require some sort of extraordinary circumstance. And one of the things that you'll see we did add in here is a finding that you all have determined that there is intrinsic value to in-person attendance, mm -hmm. uh, really setting the basis for this. But nothing's broken. Again, this really largely reduces to writing what has been the practice of this board. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we, we've always talked about somebody who was sick, uh, not, you know, maybe they, probably, frankly, if they're that sick, they probably ought to not attend the meeting, but they are, we're allowing that to happen if they ask. Do we don't, we're not separating in this anything between the workshops or the commission. I mean, we're treating them the same. So if, um, and so that maybe you could read that sentence again, the, the, um, the one that says sickness, extraordinary, that, that line just for. Sure, what, you, what you'll see about midway down on page one of the policy is the findings that we set forth there that you all would consider in making a determination. And as you'll see under B, uh, we've stated the commissioner attending virtually is incapacitated due to illness or injury or is hindered by extraordinary circumstances from appearing in person. And again, that finding of an extraordinary circumstance would be a legislative determination for the commissioners that are physically present to determine in moving forward a vote on allowing one of your colleagues to appear virtually. Okay. Um, did you have a comment? Yes, Mr. Justice. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I think it's a, you know, uh, for those of us that came from the legislature where there was a policy and procedure for everything, um, including the tie you wore and the, you know, everything uh, to come here where things were much more um, unstructured. Setting some policies was, was desirable. This is basically how we've been operating for many years. The big difference being where in the past, if someone had a cold, um, they would just come with a cold or not. But if you have a cold now, you have other concerns about what that cold really is. Um, so that was kind of what led to some of the more uh, uh, more use of the virtual policy. And we have become a lot more used to it with Zoom than we were before with the phone and things like that. So whether we set, I'm fine if we set this as our guidelines, we don't need to memorialize it in, in ordinance and penalties. But if we set this as our guidelines, I think it gives us some kind of um, a, a box to stay in or guideposts or highway markers, whatever you want to, analogy you want to use. But I think setting it as our guidelines is probably the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah I, you know, obviously we have the, the new wave of, of people being sick and you know, maybe not wanting to come here, to your point, and I, and I think that's a good one. I, I think the, 
the rare and extraordinary circumstances was verbiage that I think at least captures the intent of, look, you're on vacation, be on vacation. You know, that's not rare and extraordinary situation. I mean, yeah. And so we want people to be here. And if you're not here, sorry, you're not here. But you know, we, we, uh, I think that's the that that's the intent here. Um, and I think we have kind of gotten looser this past year on workshops versus commission meetings a little bit. So I think this tightens it up. And so, again, I don't think it's any big deal, but I think it does memorialize kind of our thoughts. So, um, so um, is there a motion to accept the, uh, what did you, how did you re reference it? Um, uh, virtual attendance board meeting guidelines. Motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Gerard. Okay. Um, and, for, you know, responsibility of each commissioner to reach out to, I would say, the chair's office to notify of their intent. Well, uh, obviously, we let staff know what we're going to be doing and, and accommodating. So, and again, just keeping in mind that the more folks that are online, the more difficult it is to uh, maneuver a meeting. So anyway, all in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Jewel. All right, moving on to county administrator, Barry. Well, it's the last meeting of the year. Um, the, the good part about this time of season is this year, um, I have about a dozen um, holiday events coming up with our staff at various departments. So it's nice to see they're able to come back together, take the time to celebrate and enjoy each other's company. Um, and you know, it'll be at those events, I really just wanna thank all of our staff for all the hard work they do all year long. Um, you know, and certainly they like everybody's been through a lot over the last couple of years. So um, just wanted to wish everybody a happy holiday, happy new year and our next meeting will be on January 6th. Okay. That was short and sweet. Thank you, Barry. Uh, we'll move on to um, under County Commission State Legislative Program. Um, I'm making sure that I know we had a couple of, we have somebody here, just one person who wants to speak on this item, but um, Brian, you want to come up and just kind of frame it? Uh, this, this, it's really our legislative program. We've talked about it before. We've kind of put it together. You, you, nicely, put our four or five items, uh, four or five pages of items on here. Um, any thoughts or comments? Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Brian Lowack, assistant to county administrator for Central and Southern Pinellas County. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And as you stated, I have met individually with with all of you um, to discuss these items. Um, you'll see uh, we have a, a couple familiar ones on there, uh, but just briefly touching on each of them, we have worked with our partners in uh, CNCN, uh, Representative, as well as Representative Latvala on the uh, extending the uh, East Lake uh, Tarpon Community Special Act. Um, the next one that we had was on our RFBs. As you know, those are used heavily here in Pinellas County. They originated in Pinellas County. Last few years, there has been, um, I'll, I'll just say an attack on, on those uh, devices. Um, the next one is uh, waste energy facilities. Uh, as you also know, we do have a waste energy facility here, and currently the way we, uh, the way that agreement operates is we generate electricity electricity from burning trash. We then uh, uh, sell that to Duke at a less than retail rate. We then turn around and purchase um, energy from Duke at, at a retail rate to power facilities, county-owned facilities such as this one. Uh, what the Florida Waste Energy uh, Coalition would be looking to do uh, is to allow local governments that have those waste energy facilities access, use that energy um, that's generated at their facilities to power uh, their county-owned facilities. Um, you will see another one on there. Um, you saw this a couple years ago. It was actually funded in the budget. Uh, this was the uh, funding request for the High Point Community uh, Park. 
Uh, unfortunately, that once that made it in the budget, that was when COVID came and it was vetoed. Um, so we're going back for round two this year and hopefully we'll be successful in those efforts. And then finally, there was uh, an addition to the guiding principles um, which would uh, encourage the legislature to seek uh, alternative funding mechanisms uh, to fund transportation throughout the state. Right now we rely on the gas tax. And just as we're dealing with uh, issues on uh, that resource, so are other communities, so is the state, so are the federal government. So uh, we have seen bills the last couple of years that would um, address that and we'd like to support those moving forward. I can answer any questions that you have, and uh, I'm also joined by Laura Beamer from the Southern Group here today. I didn't see Laura. She's oh, there. She is. Hi, Laura. Good to have you here in the in the house. Any questions by the commissioners? I think we've gone through this. Yeah. Did you Just, have something? Brian didn't mention the one, which is uh, the state support um, to support our federal request for the Dean Causeway. Um, since since we have a mayor in, in the house uh, yeah. from from a little town, I, I wanted to make sure we got that on the record. Yeah, uh, I, I, she's like right in front of me here, <laughs> and I've got her as the only. Sp I'm going to ask her to come up here in just a minute. Um, My apologies on that when I was saving that for the mayor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, I think that uh, no questions, no items here. I, 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 I talked with you about an item that was passed last session, um, and I've, I've talked to Tom Almonte. It, it has to do with the contractor's license, the specialty licenses, and that has nothing to do with what we're talking about as far as next session goes, but I know that we need to have some conversation come, going forward on the elimination of those things and how that affects those 1,400 businesses. So I look forward to that. We're gonna, yeah. Commissioner, we're going to have that. I'm going to um, bring that forward on the uh, work session for the 6th um, so we can kind of outline exactly what happened there. Based on our conversation, I did have a follow-up with staff, and I was even confused on yeah. uh, some of the impacts of that. So um, we'll bring that forward for a discussion on the 6th. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, that's great. Um, Mayor, come on up. Welcome. Sat through a long meeting to get to this, but glad you're here today. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Julie Warbachelski, Mayor of the Great City of Dunedin. You know, it's not often that elected officials um, get thanked for doing something great. So I wanted to come here on behalf of our entire city commission, our city staff, and the residents of Dunedin, um, and thank you for making uh, obtaining funding for the Dunedin Causeway Bridge a priority on your legislative agenda. It's important to all of us. I know I've been asked about it a lot. And I just wanted to say we really appreciate it and are willing, all of us in any capacity, are willing to give any support that you need in your endeavors to get this. So please keep us posted in how we can support your efforts. Um, while you're here, do, do we, we got some um, dollars, I think, from the federal government for engineering design for the bridge. Is that, is that done, finished, and are we, are we starting to do it, or what's the story there? Brian's coming up to clarify. Okay. Thank you. Hi, I Brian, remember. again. Mr. <laughs> Chair, um, uh, both of our congressmen did uh, jointly submit an appropriate an earmark request at the federal level. That was one of the uh, infrastructure um, project requests. Those, however, were not funded in the infrastructure package, um, so we are still working on that. Um, there is a placeholder that is uh, in the um, bill that is being considered now in Congress that totals the amount of all those infrastructure projects. It just doesn't have those individual projects listed, so we'll continue to work on that, but that was $8 million, which would fund the entire uh, design of the project. Okay, so I just wanna make sure that we were clear on, we have not gotten that yet, and we're still waiting and working to get that so we can get it started, and then it makes funding a little easier, trying to find funding a little bit easier too, so, yeah. Anyway, thank you very much, yep. and happy holidays to everybody. Yep. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Okay. Um, Item 44, which is appointment, reappointment to the feathers. Oh, yes, we do. Thank you, Vice Chair. Appreciate that. Um, do I have a motion to approve this 2022 state legislative program? Second. Commissioner Flowers on the motion. Commissioner Justice on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 44, which is appointment, reappointment to the Feather Sound Community Services District. Uh, for all of us, we have our individual appointments. Do I have a motion, please? So moved. Second. Commissioner Justice on the motion. Commissioner 
Seal on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 45, appointment reappointment to the Historic Preservation Board by Commissioner Long, Seal and Flowers. So moved. Motion by Commissioner Long, second by Commissioner Seal. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. On to item 46, appointment to the Lailman Community Redevelopment Area Committee. I think we have two people that are qualified or that are eligible for that seat. That is correct. It's the appointment of two, um, and there are two applicants, James Steve Cleveland and Charles Flint. Um, so I'd recommend a voice vote unless you'd like ballots. Yeah, I do have yeah, ballots. I think. Do we have a motion for that? Uh, a motion by Commissioner Peters for Steve Cleveland. Second by Commissioner Gerard. Or no, I'm sorry. Did I? Two. I'm sorry, say that. It's two, two, two appointments and there are two individuals. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Gerard. I thought there was only one. I apologize. For two, for, yeah, okay. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Gerard. So we have a motion for both candidates for the two positions and a second by Commissioner Gerard. All in favor say aye. Aye. Uh, any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Uh, and then on item 47, reappointment to the Palm Harbor uh, uh, Community Services Agency, otherwise known as FIXA, individual appointment by Commissioner Long. Motion by Commissioner Gerard. Second. Second by Commissioner Long. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Item 48, reappointment to the Unified Personnel Board, uh, uh, Board of County Commissioners as a whole, uh, approve one reappointment for the Unified Board for a two-year term. Um, and I guess Ken Peluso is available for reappointment. Motion by Commissioner Jard for Ken Peluso. Who was the second? I'm sorry. Commissioner Peters on the second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. On to item 49, appointment to the Value Adjustment Board. This is a vote by all of us for one position, and there's two candidates. Do you have, do you have ballots for those? Okay, great. If you could pass those out now, we'll, we'll do that real quickly. You need a minute. Take your, it's fine. We have time. We have oodles of time. Since the tabulation should be rather quick, I'll go ahead and wait to go ahead. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the commissioners have voted unanimously to approve Frank Mikowski okay. to the Value Adjustment great. Board. Thank he, you. Yeah, he's been there for three years and he's done a great job, so good. Um, and uh, we move on to our final item of the meeting, which is our uh, County Commission new business, and I'll open it up to the commissioners for anything that, yes, Commissioner Long. I want to alert everyone to the transportation summit that's going to be held this Friday over in Tampa at the Florida Department of Transportation building. Um, it should be very interesting and hopefully informative. So of course, any one of you that would like to go are certainly invited. And, um, and that's it for today. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, Commissioner Seal, thank you. Uh, yes, I just wanted to give you a little update on the Forward Pinellas last board meeting on November 10th. Um, we did um, ask that construction funding be added to the work program for US 19 from north of Curlew to north of Nebraska. Express lanes in the I-275 quarter from I-375 to Gateway and then um, expressway and lane continuity improvements from 54th Avenue South to Gandhi. And then per board approval, because there was an accident and Mayor Pajalski was here earlier, but um, she passionately talked about State Road 580 and Skinner and getting that moved up. So um, that was added and um, those are the most important items. Um, we did approve election of officers. Mayor Cookie Kennedy will be our chair. Commissioner Janet Long will be our vice chair. Um, Commissioner Karen Steele, secretary, and commission council member David Albert and treasurer. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Steele. Anybody else? Commissioner Justice. If nobody else says, I have a couple items. Okay, I have something, but go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, first. I would like uh, I would like to move approval for ratification of the chairman's recommendations for committee assignments for 2022. Move approval, but I do want to note that I have some calendar conflicts for PSTA, but I will do my best to attend as many as possible. Thank you. Motion by Commissioner Justice, second by Commissioner Gerard. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Com uh, move unanimously. And then I have something when you're done with yours. Okay. Um, yeah, I just had a, just a few things here. Of course, uh, just um, wanted to uh, have the prerogative to say a few thank yous. Uh, first of all, thank you, commissioners, for allowing me the opportunity to serve as your chair this past year. It's certainly been an honor to to do that, um, and um, and really have enjoyed it um, a great deal. Uh, you know, I wanted to make sure that we uh, talked about a lot of businesses and a lot of 501c3s, and we wanted to bring some of those to the to the meeting and highlight them during the year. Make sure that we continue, as we always do, our military holidays, and of course some of the special causes that come forward. In our, in our we we know we don't take them lightly here, um, and, and the FDOT has allowed us now to let the bridge be lit up if we don't have opposition. So. On, on any of these causes that uh, goes on uh, during the year. Um, and just wanted to also thank each one of you for all of the different boards that you serve on. Uh, you just approved the boards for next year. And a lot of people don't realize that we all serve on so many different boards. And, um, and to that extent, to any of you who are chairs on those boards, it even elevates it to more time. So I really appreciate all of the work um, that, uh, that, that you've done. Um, of course, you know, some votes you're disappointed in and others, uh, for the most part, I think we've done good work this year and I'm really happy about the results. Um, without getting into specifics, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank Barry and Jewel and all of their staff for, for always being there. And when I had questions or comments, uh, whatever, they, they were quick to, to, to respond uh, like they are to all of us, but I just wanted to take the opportunity to say that. Also, I um, uh, had a couple, you know, folks in North County say, well, your chairmanship is up. Uh, looking forward to having you up here even more now. So I'll get back a little bit to that. But again, we as commissioners represent all the residents of the county, um, even though we're voted in differently. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you for the patience. Um, also wanted to thank um, the 
assistants that have just they keep the floor humming. Um, they're so they're so good in so many ways. Um, I, I just can't uh, begin to enumerate that, but I didn't want it to go without saying um, our to our residents that they, when they call in, we're often not there and they're dealing with our assistants and our assistants are getting things done. Um, certainly, and I wanted to thank Stacy and Nikki in their roles as executive assistants this year. Uh, Stacy in the first part of the year, and then uh, we had the uh, great pleasure of hiring Nikki um, uh, for as our execu executive assistant. Uh, and my gosh, she has just taken over all the administrative floor duties, freeing up our own assistants to do other things. And I just, I am just so proud of the work that she's done. We had two reviews with her um, and both really good. She's taken over a lot of the main, uh, the main phone number cats that, that come in, all the boards and committees. Um, she takes care of all the purchasing, the purchasing orders. She takes care of the clergy um, and all the inventory that we do among many other things. And so she does a yo person's job <laughs> work as far as administrative and I'm really happy to have her a part of our team. Um, so, uh, Nikki, thank you for, for your work. And then um, I just finally wanted to acknowledge um, my assistant because um, she, she exhibits pure professionalism and kindness and persistence with staff on behalf of all residents. And so I just, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't do what I do without her. She has been um, simply amazing. I'm really proud of the work that she's done, especially with regards to the mailing list that she's built up uh, in an effort to communicate to our residents uh, during this past, well, year and a half that's been really, really tough. And our residents really needed that communication. And uh, they sometimes give me the credit for that, but I point to her all the time on that. She's really the one that has led that effort all about serving our our residents. So just a simple thanks to you. And, and those flowers are from me and Becky, because she said that without, <laughs> without you, I probably would have been driving her crazier than I already do at home. So thank you for everything. And uh, I guess... Commissioner we, Eggers? Yes. May I just jump in and yeah, echo? Please. I mean, honestly, I know how hard Kim has worked this year, and I sincerely, I know when your chairman, your assistant puts in countless hours, yeah. and I just really want to thank you for always having a smile on your face and for your willingness to do everything for everybody, and it's just greatly appreciated. Thank you, Commissioner Seal. Appreciate that. Yeah. Great, great work. I wanted to make sure that uh, that the, our residents, uh, they don't often, they see her, they hear her on the phone all the time, but they don't often get to see her. Um, and then uh, I know you have one more thing, and I just wanted to say on behalf of uh, my family, uh, uh, Merry Christmas to everybody. Hope you have wonderful holidays with your family, and please be safe over the New Year's, uh, New Year celebration. Now, we, we do have a second part of the meeting starting at 6, so you're welcome back for that as well, but uh, those are all public hearings. Uh, Commissioner Justice. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I was thinking, I guess I've been referencing Tallahassee today more than I, and maybe it's been long enough to where it's not as uh, nightmarish as I used to <laughs> roll around in my head. Uh, if I was in Tallahassee, I would say, uh, do I have permission to approach the well, which was the little lectern in front of the speakers. But instead, I would ask you to join me at the podium. And Mr. Chairman, let me just add my thanks, uh, along with all of your constituents in North County, uh, for your leadership on this commission. This is, uh, has not been what we would consider a traditional year. We're not in a traditional spot. We haven't had always traditional issues that we've dealt with. Uh, but you've handled it with, uh, with grace and class. And really, I think, and again, I'm harkening back to my Tallahassee days and you see in federal politics where it gets so divisive. We have times on this commission where we deal with issues and I know the votes haven't gone the way you felt, but you don't lash out. You don't treat anyone differently. You treat our colleagues with respect. And um, 
That has just been the hallmark of your leadership as chairman and as a commission. I just want to say thank you very much for that. Thank you. We have a, uh, a tradition for the commissioners, uh, an administrator, an attorney chipping in for a small chairman's gift. And the chairman has requested a donation for Palm Harbor, Feast of Palm Harbor, which is a food pantry in North County. And I would like to invite the Feast Board President, David Martin, to come forward. And we're going to present a feast for a check for $200 from the County Commission in recognition of the leadership of Chairman Dave Eggers. <laughs> and then just a small uh, card from the commissioners. Well, thank you. <clears throat> thank you on behalf of um, all the volunteers and all the guests at Feast Food Pantry. Um, it probably goes without saying that um, food insecurities right now are a, a big topic um, for you to consider Feast Food Pantry um, at this time is, 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 is uh, more than uh, uh, gracious of you. Um, just to give you a little bit of a background uh, on Feast Food Pantry, we are located in Palm Harbor at Nebraska and Belcher, uh, have been serving the community for uh, since 1989, or uh, uh, yes, since 1989. Uh, before COVID, we were serving roughly um, uh, 200 uh, uh, families a week, uh, or individuals a week. Uh, we're averaging around 800 a week right now. So, uh, so this, this goes a long way and, and it'll actually help us kick off our uh, capital campaign for a new building. So thank you very much. Um, really appreciate you considering us. Thank you. Good job. The, thank the real you. check is in the mail, David. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, thank you all for that. I think every single one of us here know about the food insecurities in different communities. And there's so many, there's Dunedin Cares, there's Safety Harbor Cares, there's Maddie Williams. You've got all of the, uh, the groups around the county. And, I think on, on all of our behalf, I, that's more symbolically picked out one of those to reflect all of our concerns about our, our residents who, who've had normally tough times, uh, but even this past year and a half, even, even worse. I, I remember when it started, the Dunedin one started, and, and it, people were asking me about the Social Services Committee. Uh, there's not people with food insecurities here. And I said, yeah, there are. And it's just as uh, the numbers that David just spoke about are just are, are, are earth shattering about the number of people right here in our own community. And these and these and these cares group, these feed, uh, the, the groups that are feeding some of our folks are just doing amazing work. So thank you for that. Thank you for the gift. And um, um, I guess we'll, uh, without seeing anything else, uh, this meeting is adjourned until six o'clock. OK.
want to take the opportunity to welcome you all here to our evening meeting of the, uh, um, of the I guess the, we're calling it the Christmas meeting, uh, the happy Hanukkah meeting and uh, happy holidays uh, to everybody uh, and to your families. Uh, we have six hearings tonight, um, two countywide planning authorities and then four uh, county, uh, Board of County Commission uh, hearings. And so uh, we will get started with our first um, countywide planning authority, CAT. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Agenda item number 51 is case number CW21-13. This is a proposal by the City of St. Petersburg to amend the countywide plan map regarding 17.91 acres, more or less, located at the northwest corner of Gandhi Boulevard and I-275. The countywide plan map category will remain as an activity center, but the underlying local future land use category will change to planned redevelopment commercial from Industrial Limited. The public hearing was properly advertised and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Thank you, Kat. Barry? If there's any questions, I mean, I can go through the uh, item, but... Yeah, it, what's it, the, you, uh, the, 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 do we need a presentation on this one or do we have any, any questions, any comments? Um, the applicant uh, is here, um, Ann Vickstrom. Um, looks like we're not asking for a staff presentation, so go ahead. Thank you very much and good evening. Ann Vickstrom with the St. Petersburg Planning and Development Services Department. This is an application for 17.9 acre amendment to the future land use map um, from Industrial Limited to Planned Redevelopment Commercial and a new development agreement for the parent 93.3 acre property. I have just a couple points that I want to briefly address um, this evening. First, the existing development agreement was approved in 2010 for 500,000 square feet of retail and office and 500, excuse me, 500,000 square feet of retail and office and 500,000 square feet of industrial. However, no development has occurred on the site to date. The proposed development agreement adds 500 multifamily units and changes the office retail square footage to industrial, thereby allowing up to 1 million square feet of industrial use. The development agreement requires 200,000 square feet of industrial use prior to the development of any multifamily use. So this plan amendment is really expanding the amount of industrial and adding multifamily. And we feel this is really a win-win for the county's business and housing. Um, the second point um, is based on information provided by Pinellas County Economic Development. It's anticipated that the industrial uses could provide uh, jobs for 331 employees with an average annual wages of $71,085, exceeding the county's average annual salary of $48,900. Um, third, after discussions with the Ford Pinellas Board um, concerning a potential access along I-275 between Gandy and Roosevelt for the subject property, we received correspondence from Daniel Santos at the Florida Department of Transportation District 7. He's the transportation supervisor in which he states that the district prohibits direct access to the interstate and interstate ramps to ensure the facility remains an access class one limited access interstate highway and further states if there were no limitations on access to the interstate, then operationally the high speed and high volume traffic move, movement serving the interstate would be undermined and contrary to the intent of the limited access facility. Mr. Santos indicates that the department has a finding of no objection to the proposal. However, if the application is amended to include direct access to either I-275 or the merge lane along Gandhi Boulevard, the department will object to the plan amendment. Um, and finally, we have received no opposition to the, to the proposed plan amendment um, 
for the development agreement. It has been unanimously supported by the St. Petersburg City Council, Ford Pinellas Board, the Planners Advisory Committee, and the amendment is consistent to the countywide and to the city's comprehensive plans, and we ask that you approve this request. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Thank you. Thank you. Yeah hold, hold, yeah, hold on one second if we oh. can. We had one other speaker. Sorry. No, it's okay. Um, Don Mastry, is Don here? Well, you just never know, but, okay. uh, but, but, you know, it was a good indication when we didn't ask for a staff presentation. So. Yes. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, my name is Don Mastery. My address is 200 Central Avenue, and I'm representing Gray Star Development East and Jable. Uh, J Jable is the contract purchaser of the 93 acres, I mean, is the seller of the 93 acres to Gray Star Development. The request is to amend the designation of 17.91 acres of the 93.38 acres and to develop 500 multifamily residential units and simultaneously 200,000 square feet of industrial use. And in addition, over a two to three year period, there will be 675,000 square feet of industrial uses built, ultimately creating an estimated 3,300 direct and indirect jobs which is more jobs and higher paying jobs than the existing development agreement will provide. The developer has submitted a development agreement which requires the construction of 200,000 square feet of industrial use prior to or concurrently with the multifamily units being built, and at least 20% of the multifamily units must be affordable housing units for a 30-year period. I would point out that 200,000 square feet of industrial space in this county is a very low, it's more than most years that are built, developed everywhere in the county, and uh, 600,000, 675,000 square feet is a huge industrial project for our county. The development agreement also provides for buffering to protect the residential units, requires a noise mitigation study, and prohibits loading or manufacturing adjacent to the residential units. And I'd like to provide a few additional facts that I think support the granting of the request. The proposed residential use is compatible with the existing adjacent residential uses to the west. The proposed site is along two major roads, Gandy Boulevard and 28th Street, and the amendment area is vacant, underutilized, and has never been developed for anything since the beginning of time, and it has been for sale for many years without a buyer. It has, this site has never created any job creation or had any utilization. The residential development within the gateway area will contribute to minimizing travel requirements given the large nearby employment presence and it will also reduce traffic. The amendment area is along two PSTA routes, one on Gandhi Boulevard and the other on 28th Street and the amendment area will provide housing opportunity for the workers at the industrial space to be built. The proposed residential and industrial development will complement each other. Your staff has made two findings in support of the recommendation for approval, and I'd like to read, they're very brief, read them. The activity center category is appropriate for the proposed use of the property and is consistent with the criteria for utilization of this category, and the proposed amendment either does not involve or will not significantly impact the remaining relevant countywide consideration. That's the conclusion that your staff has reached. I'd answer any questions you Thank have you. and would urge your approval. Thank you, Don. Thank as, you. As usual, very detailed. Appreciate that. Any questions for Don? Uh, Commissioner Long, you had a motion, I think? I did. Motion for approval. Yes. Okay. Do we have a second? Commissioner Gerard on the second. Any final thoughts or questions? All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, moving on to item 52, a second item under the countywide plan. Kat? Mr. Chair, agenda item number 52 is case number CW21-15. This is a proposal by the city of Pinellas Park to amend the countywide plan map from Employment, Retail and Services and Target Employment Center to Retail and Services and Target Employment Center. 
This is regarding 5.25 acres, more or less, located approximately 750 feet southwest of Almerton Road and 49th Street North. The public hearing was properly advertised and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. No correspondence has been received and the matter is properly before the authority to be heard. Thank you, Kat. Barry? These are two existing hotels that are be converted to 183 residential multifamily. Um, eight unit of these units uh, designated for affordable housing. Both uh, Port Pinellas and Planners Advisory uh, unanimously recommended approval. Okay. Any question uh, by anybody on any board members? Um, we do have um, one uh, one person um, who is attending attending online. Matt Newton is he there, Cat? Um, Mr. Newton, you have already raised your hand in the Zoom application. Uh, we're going to ask you to unmute. Once you're unmuted, if you could state, spell your name for the record, state your address, you will have three minutes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Newton. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Matt Newton of the law firm of Shoemaker, Loop, and Kendrick. 101 East Kennedy Boulevard, Suite 2800 in Tampa. I'm here on behalf of the developer, Eco Property Capital, in support of this application. I'd just like to take a very quick moment to recognize and sincerely thank the City of Pinellas Park staff, as well as Ford Pinellas, for their hard and diligent work during this process. We respectfully request that this board accept the recommendation of the Planners Advisory Committee, as well as Ford Pinellas, and approve this request. Appreciate your time this evening, and happy holidays. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. Um, any, any questions, any other comments? Do I have a motion? Um, motion by Commissioner Gerard, second by Commissioner Long. Sorry, I didn't. <laughs> All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Okay, on to item 53. Um, Kat, please go ahead. Thank you. Agenda item number 53 is a legislative petition to vacate. This was submitted by Mikhail A. Foken, Zilia Ruga, Hugo E. Gonzalez, Rosemary Craig Gonzalez, Kimbo McNeil, and Mary McNeil. It's to vacate the 50-foot wide right-of-way of Palmetto Avenue, lying east of Elm Street and west of Church Street, and then also the 10-foot wide alley lying east of and adjacent to lot six through 10, block number two, and west of and adjacent to lots one through five, block number two, all being a part of the Jackson Park subdivision. The public hearing was properly advertised and affidavit of publication has been received for filing. Uh, letters of no objection have been received with spe Spectrum advising that the petitioner would bear the expense of any required relocation of its facilities. All interested parties have been notified as to the date of the public hearing. Two emails in opposition have been received. The matter is properly before the board to be heard. Thank you, Kat. Barry? On this one, you have a denial, um, a, a recommendation for denial of the petition, so I'd ask for staff to provide a brief report. Thank you. Welcome, Blake. Thank you, Commissioner, and a pleasure to be here. My name is Blake Lyon. I'm the Director of Building and Development Review Services. Um, we have before you, again, the request um, that's located on 728 Elm Street. Uh, Elm Street's a little bit of a misnomer, and I'll, and I'll describe that a little bit in greater detail. Uh, the property is one property uh, to the east of Elm Street, separated by a, an adjoining property, um, but because Palmetto is not improved and Church Street, the other side is not improved, um, it, it carries with it the 728 address. So as you can see here in the image before you, the property is uh, located in the unincorporated portion of the city of Safety Harbor. And one of the things that's not detailed um, adequately in, in this image is that this is really a enclave within the city. In fact, the entirety of these uh, cluster of parcels are completely surrounded by the city of Safety Harbor. And so one of the things that we look at from the county's perspective uh, and that the county administrator has derived from that is what are those types of services that are provided, especially when uh, we're kind of going into the heart of or in the middle of the jurisdiction and trying to address that. So part of the county's staff's efforts, not only with the applicant, but have also been to reach out and discuss a lot of this 
with um, the City of Safety Harbor's uh, City Manager, Matthew Spohr, and their Public Works Director, Renee Cooper. So we've had some, some continued discussion with them as well. Um, bear with me one second. All right. So uh, what you'll see in this image is the, the red icon there is showing um, the location of the subject property. Elm runs north and south just to the left of this. Uh, what I realize we should have done here is provide you a little bit of that, but there's a cluster right around that red icon where there's a series of about 10 to 12 properties that are unincorporated and then, again, entirely surrounded by the, the city proper. Um, what we're seeing here is the, the applicant that originally came in is located in the upper right-hand corner. It has, um, that's the area where the proposed home will be uh, built here. Uh, on that vacant lot, and I'll use the different, uh, so the upper kind of purple um, image there. Palmetto runs east-west. It's an existing uh, right-of-way that, that's there, but it's unimproved, and I'll show you some photos in a little bit. And then there is a north-south alley that's about 15 feet wide. What also begs your a little bit of attention on this map is that along the northern boundary of the properties that you see there is actually a water feature. And so we've been working with, um, and it's an impaired water body that we've been working with public work staff to make sure that we address that. One of the challenges that exists on this particular property is it's not currently served by any uh, utilities on there. So to develop a home on that property would require um, septic, which is, a, which is problematic in some respects to the proximity of the impaired water body for fecal uh, matter as well, as well as the fact that it does not have uh, any potable water on that, so they would be served by a well. And so some of the discussion that we've had with the fire marshal is the concern that if uh, Palmetto is vacated or left unimproved, how do they provide fire or emergency access to the property, especially if the um, fire sprinklers that are being provided for that home are required to be serviced off of the well, and it, and it again poses some concerns and some issues. And so the county staff had, has met with the um, applicant that's desiring to build the home and tried to work through a variety of different issues. In some instances, will allow for um, a private driveway and road to service the site and not to build the road in its entirety. Um, but that doesn't work in, in, its, um, in its proposition to the fire marshal. They need a, a larger full access for uh, fire rigs should they need to service the property. And so the city's position really is we're in the process right now of taking Palmetto and trying to transfer it to the city because it doesn't make sense for us to retain a, a, a bit of right of way uh, you know, in, in the entirety of their city, as I mentioned before. And so the city has taken the position either improve the roadway entirely to, to full standard or don't improve it, but don't give us something that's somewhere in the middle. Uh, and so that's what we're here to discuss with you all this evening is, um, you know, whether that is vacated and they're required to improve it in its entirety or left uh, in its current state. So what you'll see here on the image to the left is also this um, diagonal yellow line is the potable water that actually serves the city of St. Petersburg. It runs and traverses a lot of this area. And then the image on the right also shows the kind of the existing parcelization and the, the properties in question are for developed for the single family home or um, over here on the upper right hand side. And so. These are a variety of considerations that have gone into it from the county's perspective. And when we talk through it both with public works, uh, with planning, with development review services, really our position is, is summarized by the fact that we feel like the county would like to uh, transfer this right of way over to the city and their preferences, again, either fully developed or left undeveloped, but not somewhere in the middle in between. So this image that you're seeing here is, a, is um, sitting out on Elm Street, looking east towards the subject property, which would be behind the, the existing home that you see there, looking down that kind of gravel roadway. And then coming down the other end of that, looking back towards Elm Street to the, to the west, 
uh, is the other side of that. So we have gone through, and this is, um, sorry, this is looking north to the undeveloped property on the right side of this image. And so that's certainly what is being considered. Again, county departments uh, were queried and they do have concerns and objections to that. The city, Har city of Safety Harbor has also communicated some objections, but none of the uh, utility providers have had objections as long as the uh, future development would bear the cost of relocation of any of those uh, utilities that might service that particular area. We've gone through a, a series of different pre-applications, staff meetings, we've gone through quite a bit of correspondence again, both with the family that chooses to, to develop that particular lot, as well as with the city. Um, and even despite all those efforts, and we have gone through a number of different ways to try to find opportunities to get access to that property so they can develop that property without having to build the entirety of the roadway and looking at uh, a number of different issues, but ultimately it's come down to the recommendation uh, that they feel like because of the desire to transfer that right of way um, to the city that we can't support the request to vacate it. Uh, we would like to um, get your support in that, but certainly happy to answer any questions that you might have. I know we've got some folks here that want to speak to it, so it, that might uh, generate some questions as well be happy to go through those details. Um, any questions? Um, yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Seal. So from what you've said, there's no, I have two questions at this point. The first one is there's no other way to get to this property except for through Palmetto. Right now there, Palmetto, Church, yes. Right Church now, Street is not. Church um, Street is also unimproved. So Church yeah. Street runs north and south on the far right here of the image. If you're looking at it on this side, it's the, this is Church Street. That's also unimproved. Okay. And so right now there's no improved street frontages to this property. Part of the discussion we've had with the owners of this pur purple parcel here mm -hmm. on the upper right was actually whether they could get an easement through the adjacent property, which right. is the seller of this. So we've, we've gone through a number of those different alternatives. I'll let the, the property owner speak to why they didn't feel favorable about um, that those, about okay. those issues and the second question and it's a little bit stickier question but um we're always sensitive to annexations <laughs> so are we putting these property owners in a situation where they're going to be forced to annex in order to get their driveway and their access that's uh, that's a, a good possibility, and that's one of the things that has been a point of contention, um, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the property owners, but that's certainly been the nature of our conversation is, okay, if they are going in, in particular in this one, because it is entirely surrounded by the city and, and we don't have any utilities in the area, it's all water, sewer, oh, it is. Uh, all for the city, mm -hmm it's a little harder from our perspective to maintain that kind of hole in the donut and, and not have everything else. And so our conversations with the city have been, well, if we are gonna annex it, they either want it not improved or entirely improved up to their, up to their standards. Um, we can't force the issue of water connection and sewer connection. I'll let Kelly speak to this a little bit as well. Uh, but that's been part of our concern. I just wanted to, to say that, um, you know, this is part of our right-of-way transfer program, and it's not just this right-of-way. It's, it's, um, it's church, it's Palmetto, and it's roads in and around this, this area. So this isn't an isolated right-of-way that, that we're working on. This is part of the roadway transfer agreement that we've been working on with the City of Safety Harbor. And I, I wish we could pull this out so you could really see how into the city this is. Um, I don't know if you can see the, the jurisdiction, but it, it is like 100% city all around it. And so um, but it is really it just is. these four parcels that are 
um, surrounded, or is it there are some to the south? south Those are the well. folks that had um, submitted the letters opposing the the um, vacation because they would also need um, Palmetto for access. So, thank you, Kelly. Um, you can see the larger roadway yeah. over here. I mean, that's kind of the city limits here. So what we're talking about, the enclave of county properties is really just right around the the red icon there. So okay. all of this is, is city. All of this is, I mean, it's, it's 360 degrees around <laughs> those properties that, that are part of it. So this is kind of that hole of the donut uh, right in the in the middle of that, so. Okay, thank you. Uh, Blake, <clears throat> I, mean, I, had a, I had a couple of questions. Um, I did have the opportunity to go out and meet with the um, the property owners and the, where the purple is, the ones that bought the property. Right. Um, had a lot of discussion with them. I'm not I'm not going to speak for them at all. They they'll they'll have opportunities themselves, but. Um, uh, I think their their preference would be to stay to stay in the county and do the um, do, again you know not not to have to annex in, but one of the things that we we've talked about is the, uh, uh, um, that you said they're avoiding the need to improve Palmetto Avenue and I think they've proposed a a a smaller substandard road from from the north south road that fronts fronts that street right um and so they have proposed indeed proposed that through there I, my argument really was that you know you don't need a vacation to do that you know, we can you can have access to your property with a substandard road clearly the road out there is also substandard right that this the road that's a city road is substandard and my and my com you know again i you know had an opportunity to talk to the city manager as well and um, I asked him about why would you require that road to be built up to standards when you don't have standards out on the main road. It dead ends there. You cannot connect that road to church because at the end of that road, it's a piece of private property already owned by somebody else. It is not a right of way that we, that we own at the end of that red dot to the east. Okay. Over here, yeah, right. that little rectangular piece there is owned by um, a private owner. So Church Street would never connect with, the, 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 unless you bought that property, right? right. Um, so to me, I, I, you know, again, the argument really was, why don't you, you know, and, and I didn't get any indication that the city was gonna require that that road be brought up to standard. In fact, it was said that you could probably use some kind of other material that's not even paved material in there. Um, and the, the, only, the only issue that I raised, they said there's, there's a little buffer there between the road and that right-of-way um, that the city owns, that they just have to make sure that the city of St. Petersburg approves anything that's done there. Now, when you showed me that, uh, that yellow line that goes through there, it, 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 it's a little deceptive in that that's a, apparently like a 40-inch line. It's, yeah. a, it's, one of their, it's a main water line to St. Petersburg. Um, but it didn't seem on that line there to, I mean, it goes right through there. It doesn't seem to hit the right of way in front of that. Uh, Correct. It does not hit the, the property in question. This basically the, the, where they'd like to build a home are these lots one through five over here in the right. upper northeast. Um, to your point, commissioner, the county does have a practice when there's existing right of way and it's serving a single family residence that we oftentimes will allow for effectively a private driveway that it would, would start here at the point where there is public road access and carry through and, and to that point. And in most cases, that's somewhere in the order of 10 to 12 feet of, a, you know, kind of a private drive. The fire marshal has indicated a desire to have a 20 foot access if they have to get a, a rig, you know, down here and provide access or provide some alternative means of fire suppression. One of the ways that they can do that is through sprinklering a new home. The challenge is, is that sprinklering out in a new home often is predicated on having a existing water line that serves that. Doing that with a well, you know, God forbid the home were to catch on fire and the, and the electricity turn off, then the, the electricity doesn't power the well, then you can't provide the water to the fire spring. So there's a, there's a compounding issue that that presents itself that would need to be addressed. And 
again, that's not for me to say, that's for the fire marshal to come up with those preferred alternatives. But one, we, in our discussions with the city, it was okay, we don't wanna kinda get half in, half out, either, either we improve the roadway uh, or we don't, um, but that's kind of where, where our conversations led with, with the city. Okay, well, I mean, whether it's, whether it's vacated or not, and whether there's a roadway of 10 feet or 20 feet built, there's just, you're still gonna have the fire marshal weighing in. True. So it, it, that's immaterial. I'm not necessarily arguing for a vacation. What I'm trying to get some clarity on because there seemed to be some real confusion between what the city says is, would be required, if they annexed, let's say, right. what the city says they'd require versus what, you know, they understand it to be that's needed. So yeah. I, I was getting the indication that there's no full road that's required there. Yeah. And, and these folks, you know, obviously there needs to be some kind of clarity uh, to, what, to what they have. The, the other indication was the, the north-south vacation wasn't as much of a concern, but. Um, in, no, in, you're right, that's, a, that's an existing platted alley. It's about 15 feet in, in width. The um, public works, and, and Kelly can speak to this in greater detail if necessary, but what we're trying to do is make sure there's access to the, the creek and the water body up here. Mm -hmm. One of the points of discussion was there's an existing, from top of bank, there's an existing 25 feet there. We're asking basically for the provision of an additional 15 feet going horizontal so that there's adequate access to serve that, and I'll let Yeah, there's a major drainage channel there. You can't really see it because it's heavily treed, but also on the corner of the uh, parcel. There's, uh, there's a major uh, channel drainage that drain runs east-west on correct. the north side. Yeah, yeah correct. Okay. And right here, we have a permitted stormwater facility, a sump that we maintain. And so normally the code provides um, that we can, that we request a, a 25 foot drainage easement over that area so that we can maintain the drainage channel here in case these trees were to fall in and, and cause an obstruction that we need to clear. Um, we requested 15 feet um, and, uh, and, and did um, make, a, make a, uh, a request to meet in the field with the applicant, but uh, we were uh, turned down. Um, but we did request 15 feet at this north part uh, so that we could have access to the major drainage channel. That, that, would, be a, that would be an east-west easement. Correct. As opposed to any discussion about the Yeah, vacate, it has nothing to the, do with the, right, the, the, um, the alleyway, yeah. okay. north and south, no. Okay. In your, in your packet, uh, you will see, and I, forgive me, I don't recall the page, but the property owner that owns these lots to the west side has indicated a willingness to, to accommodate that uh, request. So. Okay, any, uh, any other questions at this point? I mean, I'm sure we'll have some others, but uh, we do have, God bless, bless you. you. We do have a couple of speakers um, that have registered to speak. Um, so, <clears throat> let me see here, I've got um, it's item 53, so Barbara Bronson, um, well, there's, there, uh, there are four applicants here, four individual people. Um, is there somebody that's speaking on behalf of the applicant? You are. I'm sorry, I, I'm seeing you and I'm seeing a raised hand back here. Okay, so you're speaking, you're, you, you're the one that's gonna come forward to speak, uh, uh, take the 20 minutes to give your presentation. Okay, thank you, come on up. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Thanks, sir. You may get that microphone over in front of you, so you, know, you can move it if you need to. Thanks, sir. No. Good evening, everyone. My name is Zilia Ruga, and I represent petitioners in this matter. I represent four property owners that are adjacent to the Palmetto Avenue. First of all, I would like to reserve time for rebuttal, please. Yeah, you have 20 minutes, okay. so if you, re you can reserve as much of that time for rebuttal as you need. Thanks, sir. And second of all, I would like to say 
special thank to Chair Egger for visiting the site, because nobody else before that has done it, yeah. actually visit the site and saw it with the eyes. And we also have to say, say thank to county staff for bringing this together, for hearing, for answering our emails, meeting with us, we really appreciate it. Dear commissioners, the whole purpose of the petition to vacate is to allow property owners to access their property. What we are asking to grant this petition so we can access the property, so we can exercise our property rights, and we can build the house, our dream house. But the county essentially is saying in denying, uh, trying to, de recommending denial of this application is that instead of vacating Palmetto Avenue, we have to go through entire expenses of building full road, and that is, that is unreasonable. And what we are asking, commissioners, is very reasonable. We are asking to allow us to access our property. We are asking to allow us to build the driveway that would be connected to the existing Elm Street. And I will show it. So we are trying to build a 10-foot driveway that would allow access to our property. And that request is reasonable. That's why we have all these people here who are in support. This is a small neighborhood. We have about only 10 households. And we have six of them sitting here showing the support. As you can see, commissioners, oh, I'm sorry. As you can see, commissioners, both sides of Palmetto Avenue were previously vacated on the east and on the west. That would actually cut our neighborhood from connectivity to other road, not road network. This piece was vacated in 1988, and this piece of Palmetto Avenue was vacated in 1997. At that time, there were no public purpose, there was no municipal purpose exist as local government granted petition to vacate. And that, that's why we are cut, we are secluded here, and that's why we don't have any access to our property. What we are asking commissioners is very reasonable. This is no outlet zone. We are trying to get access to our property. As you can see, we are taking this very seriously. We are prepared. Before purchasing this property, we contacted the county. We asked them what challenges we could face in building the single family house. In response, we received two emails stating that two foot driveway would be enough, would be sufficient for the county. Also stating that the county's normal practice is to allow property owners to have this 10-foot driveway, that property owners for single-family home do not require to build full road extension. And now we have here requirement to fully develop road that is absolutely unnecessary, does not serve anybody else, but these two property owners. Next, I will try to address county's concerns that we received prior to this hearing. As county stated that county was trying to obtain access easement to the, to the channel B of Creek, and what they are asking is almost 35 to 40 foot easement in return of only this piece of property that they have now but that the county have, has now. And it's again, uh, that is unreasonable. We offer it to have access 10 foot wide alongside of the creek. And that did not work out. Historically, 
maintenance team had been accessing this creek through Elm Street. Our alley has never been used as access point to the to maintain the creek. And as commissioner, uh, commissioner, as the county staff presented during the time, they said that they are not interested in this alley at all. So that's why we are asking grant this petition and vacate this alley as well. But the, the main point of our petition is to vacation of Palmetto Avenue, because that is problem that keeps our house from development. And that slide is very important to address, to address county's objections. As you can see, our neighborhood is a very small neighborhood. It's secluded from any other road network. There is no connection to any, any other road. So there is no impact to road network. This is no outlet zone. Most of the neighbors are here in support of this petition. And it is very important to say that there are commercial buildings on the right side of these properties, on the right side of Church Street. Right here. And we just talked to the property owner on Saturday who shared with us that those commercial buildings pro produce fiberglass dust, which we were not aware of. So those trees on Church Street, on that street, and this part of Palmetto Avenue serve as natural barrier against this fiberglass dust and noise. If these streets would ever be developed, we would be exposed to those commercial nuisances. Now we will try to address city's concerns when they submitted very general, non-specific objections to our petition to vacate. It appears that the City of Safety Harbor just submitted general objections without any specifying any reasons for denial of this petition just to be on the safe side. First of all, there are no utilities on Palmetto Avenue or easements that need to be relocated. First. The second reason, that this Palmetto Avenue would serve only adjacent property owners. Church Street has never been developed, Palmetto Avenue has never been developed, has never been used for public access in over 100 years. As was stated before, there is no impact on any existing road network, because this is a very secluded area, there is no connection with any other roads. And to the fourth reason of provided by City of Safety Harbor, we again prepared very, very good for, that, uh, for this hearing. And we submitted public record request asking city, please provide us any documentation, any reason showing why do you need this right of way? Why do you need this alley? In response, city did not produce any specific reason why do they need it, any specific plan. Uh, excuse me, uh, which alleyway are you talking about? The north-south one? Correct, that's okay. the subject of this Thank petition. You. Go ahead. City did not provide any reason why do they need those Palmetto Avenue or the alley between us. Commissioners, we sold my house in Clearwater in reliance of county's representation that we can build a house in our property. Proceeds from sale uh, that do not have that, that, that the same value that we had at the time we sold the house last year. You can see the prices went dramatically. Cost of labor went dramatically. Cost of materials went dramatically. And now what the county is asking us to develop full road, and that is unreasonable. It would place additional burden on our project. And all we can do is try to build a shelter for us, for our family. And our request is very, very reasonable. And what the county is asking is unreasonable. We have all these people who came here to show their support. They, they see us struggling going through this process. And we try to work it out very hard. 
with county staff meeting with the city. And I would like to address county Mr. Director's line presentation and Director's line arguments. I would like to address his point just to, to correct his understanding of what's going on. Uh, and you have nine minutes. Do you want to reserve any time uh, for rebuttal I'll, later or? I will be quick. I will okay, just to try fine. to address what uh, um, Director fine. Lyons that's stated. Fine. Director Lyons correctly stated that this is an enclave within the city, within, uh, surrounded by the city. But it appears that we've been penalized for being inside of county and not annexing to the city. And the reason that we, uh, we did not submit our application to annex to the city is that numerous meetings that we had with the city, we had meetings with Dece on December 17th, we have recorded meetings, we, it was recorded by, uh, with permission of all participants. We, we also had March 18th meeting, and we have documentation sent to us where the city is requiring prior to submitting our annex application, fully developed road. They are also requiring us they are also would not allow to build a house on splitted lots. They want us to go through additional steps to combine lots and only after that they will consider our application to annex. So do, that would additionally delay our project that we're trying to build a house. And what we are asking is just to allow us to build 10 foot driver on this property, on this Palmetto Avenue, so we can have access, so our building permit can be approved. As to the Director Lyons' comment about fire marshal safety requirements, we take it very seriously. We had numerous discussion with fire marshal. We addressed all his comments, we addressed all his concerns. We have last letter sent to us after reviewing our preliminary plans, additional corrected plans. We have letter from July 2nd from Fire Marshal of Safety Harbor who is providing services for county, who, who stated little, little nuances that we need to correct in submitting our plans. And we addressed those issues. What the fire marshal is saying is just to have little extension for the fire truck T-turn here. Fire marshal does not require to fully develop this road. What the fire marshal is asking to have a place for the T-turn and we addressed and we accommodated this request. As to the sprinkler system, we hired a licensed contractor who provided specific plans that allow us to use our sprinkler system and well, they have special reserve, res, reservoir that holds water for situation like that Director Lyon just described. In case something happened with the well, this reservoir, re, reservoir's additional tank has enough water to supply water to address fire emergency. And we have neighbor, our neighbor here, the property owner Mr. McNeil, who works as a fire marshal and he knows this, he would not be in support of this petition if it would jeopardize any fire marshal concerns. Again, dear commissioners, we are begging you to grant our petition. We need the access, we need to start to work on this project. We need to build a house, we need to build a shelter for our family. We want we hope you understand our concern and listen to us. Because this is legislative hearing. You have a great discretion of the authority to grant our petition, to allow us access to exercise property rights. And what we're asking is very reasonable. And, it's, and what the county is asking, unreasonable. Thank you very much. Okay. And you'll have about a little over five minutes for any rebuttal at the end. Yes. Ma'am? Ma'am? Zilia? Yes, sir. Uh, before you walk away, you had mentioned in your presentation that you had emails from county staff. That is correct. That said that you would only be, that was limiting what you would need to do. Do you have those that you could yes. share with us? Sure. No, no, it's you, fine. You, you can give it to her. Yes. 
Anything? Any, anything else? Okay. Okay, we have, um, we have, I'm showing three speakers. Um, all the three speakers that are registered. Yes, did you have anything else? I just shared this. Okay, yes. that's fine. We'll take that. Um, and I just want to let the three speakers come forward. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Barbara Bronson, come forward, and then Hugo Gonzalez, and then Rosemary Gonzalez. Good evening. Good evening. My Welcome. name is Barbara Bronson, and I live at 725 Elm Street. Um, that property uh, was my grandmother's. Uh, later in years, uh, my husband and I acquired the property, and we've lived there, well, I, I might as well say all of my life, because um, after we were married, my children were raised there, and now my grandchildren are not there all the time, but they come visit, of course. But I am in total agreement with the petitioners, because shortly after we had our house built on our property, we also made a request to vacate um, the land between the two adjoining properties on Palmetto. Uh, we went through the same procedures. We had no problems at all having the request granted. This is a lovely couple, lovely family that's making this request so they can move forward in their lives. Um, so we're asking that you just please, please take into consideration all that has been done, the time and effort that has been put in to fulfill everything that has been requested of them, and please grant their petition. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara. And then, uh, um, is, this, is this Rosemary? Rosemary yeah. Gonzalez. Uh, yeah. Hugo Gonzalez is in the hospital, so he uh, wouldn't. I'm sorry Very about much that. wanted to be here. Yeah, sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Go yeah, ahead. I live, uh, we live uh, 734 Elm Street. It's in front of their property, and the alleyway is the side of our property, the, the property that we're talking about. So uh, we really feel that uh, every effort should be made to, to grant this for these people. They've worked very hard to, uh, to have a home and still not able to because of, they won't allow certain things. So uh, we would appreciate if, if you would allow this to happen. Um, Any more questions? I think we're good right now. Okay. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you. Thank you. Um. Commissioner, I, my name is uh, Kimball McNeil. I did register. Yeah, I'm, got, I'm just going to call you right now, so come on up. Yes. Kimberly McNeil, yep, 720 Elm. Go ahead and introduce yourself, please. Yes, Kimball McNeil, 720 Elm Street, Kimball, K I M B L E, McNeil, M C N E A L. I live at 720 Elm Street. It's uh, south of Palmetto, and I have property to the uh, east of 720 Elm uh, Street, two lots, which is south of Palmetto. Uh, Mr. Mike and his wife came to me when they purchased the property, well, actually before they purchased it, to see that I have any concern about them maybe developing uh, Palmetto and uh, having access if they purchased the property. My wife and I had no objections. Uh, they are very good neighbors. That is a unique street we live on. I can't wait to turn on my street to go home. It's a very uh, good feeling when I turn on my street and go home, see my neighbors, greet my neighbors, and uh, they are great neighbors. And I pray and hope that you guys see that they are and grant them their petition to build a home for their family. Thank you. Uh, you have a second for a question? Yes, sir, I do. Um, um, yeah, a, a lovely home, by the way. I was, uh, and uh, just a question on the uh, the idea that again we're going to address. I'm going to we're going to address with staff the need 
for a vacation to do what these folks need done. That's a separate issue. But let's assume that there is a vacation and, and effectively you and the house to the north landlock the applicant, the, of the homeowner that needs access. I'm assuming that there's some agreement, a legal agreement that's been worked out between you two homeowners that are going to have ownership of that right of way. Yes, sir. And the homeowner that's going to want to build in the back, there, because effectively you're you're blocking them from uh, accessing. So there, there's an agreement between you all if this passes to access the property. Well, at this point, I don't have any uh, any uh, plans of developing my part behind me no more because right. I have access through my back fence. Right. I want to be able to play ground for my grandkids. Yeah. That's what I want to do on mine. But the roadway, I mean, he needs it for his home. Right. My home is already built, and I don't have a problem with, with him getting it built. But you understand what I'm asking. Yes, sir. Because you guys are... I understand okay. that uh, 25 feet of it would be deeded yeah. to my wife and myself. Right, and the other a homeowner to the north would get the remaining and there would be no way to access their property unless you all have an agreement with them. Yes, sir. So that will be necessary. Yes, sir, for sure. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, I don't think I have anybody else. Um, did we have one petitioner that sent uh, something in objection? We, we did have one. We, we had two emails in opposition. Two emails in opposition. Mm -hmm. And where, where were they? Do they have an address? Um, let, me s let me pull up the emails. They're okay. attachment number 14 for the Legistar file. One was um, the Corelli, was, was the email I got yesterday, I think. And that's 710 Elm Street. That was one, Angelica Corelli. And then the other one is a, it, I'm guessing a relation, um, Vincenzo Corelli was the other. Okay. And if you look at the petitioner's application on slide 11, it identifies all the different properties, including the Corellis, which is south of Mr. and Mrs. McNeil's property. Okay, thank you for that. So I, what I just find interesting is I can't figure out why the Corellis would be objecting. Yeah, I don't, I don't, so. I don't. Yeah, I don't, I don't know either. Um, okay, so um, I don't have anybody else to, to speak, right? Um, and uh, you all have the applicant. The applicant has a five minutes and nine seconds that they can use if they would like. They, di they did not pre-register, I don't think, did they? Um, do you do you have them on there? I do have an individual who's raised their hand. It's A V I E R or E I R A, Anthony. Um, it, it's up to yeah. It's up to um, the board's discretion. Um, I'm going to um, I'm going to allow a couple two minutes. And so if you can let him know, he'll have two minutes. This is really a strict requirement we have to register the day before. So I just don't want this to become a precedent for the new chair that he's, that's going to be running the meeting next year. So um, I'm going to have to t cut a minute off of that time. So give him two minutes. All um, right. So Anthony, we're going to unmute you, and then you can go ahead. You have two minutes, sir. Thank you. I, I apologize. I couldn't pre-register. I got tied up at work, but I really apologize. So I'm, I'm the owner of 755 Elm Street. I'm right across from Hugo. My property on the northern side does fall as shares the same creek that they, the, the applicants are trying to build on as well. I heard some of the comments about the whole creek and trying to get access to the creek to maintain it. Can you, everybody hear me? Yes, Hello? we can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Go right ahead. Okay, sorry. So uh, there was some concerns about the county or the city trying to be able to access the creek to maintain it. Earlier this earlier last year, I had issues with this creek, and I actually went hired a contractor. They went to the county, asking what we can what we can do to improve to protect do something to the creek because it was starting to impact my home. The county came back, and I believe the applicants have the email, 
the county came back and said they do not have jurisdiction on that creek. That they, the creek is uh, their, their, the county's property ended at the bat on the west side of my property. So I don't understand how the county is saying they need access to the creek when they weren't willing to help me with the issue of the uh, erosion I was having on my property, which is to the west of the applicant. And so I ended up having to spend like 60 grand to reinforce that creek to protect my house. So I'm in favor for the applicant to be able to build this home because there's so much stuff that the county is trying to, doesn't want to deal with the unincorporated land. The city wants to impose for the applicant to develop a full roadway when there's not going to be really that much traffic going through this road. Three minutes or two minutes. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your, your weighing in, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, anybody else that I missed? We're clear? I don't have anybody okay. else pre-registered. Okay, okay. Um, back to the applicant. You do have five minutes, uh, a little over five, five minutes and six seconds. Um, I, if you want, um, uh, Blake, did you, are you going to come back up? Do you have some additional comments or are we going to have some questions of staff? I'm asking the commissioners any, yes. Uh, ho uh, why don't you wait and let, let him speak first and then you can rebut at, at the end. Thank you. I, I appreciate the opportunity. And there's one point of clarification that I'd really like to make some distinction on. The county is not requiring full development of the road. There's been a, a couple statements to that effect, and I want to be clear about, about that. What the county's position is, is that we don't feel it's appropriate for us to maintain the right-of-way in an enclave scenario. And therefore, it either needs to be um, transitioned to the city like Kelly was referencing, we have the larger program that is trying to address that issue. Um, the requirement to fully develop the road, as you heard um, Ms. Ms. Ruga say, was one that was borne by the city. The county's position is if you're going to retain that right of way, then we have, and we, as were stated in those emails, and that our typical and standard practice is the you know, the private drive that provides access to that, as well as the appropriate fire access and the fire marshals, the one that opines on that. So we're not asking for full development of the roadway. However, having said that, we do think it's appropriate for us not to be in the business of maintaining that right of way in the middle of that enclave. And so that's our position to, uh, to pursue the transfer of this roadway to the city and let the development occur within the city according to their rules and requirements. That's the county staff position on that. So that, that's just the distinction that I wanted to, to make on that. Blake, how long has that been going on? These folks bought their property and been talking to you for over a year. Yeah, the, the discussion about the annex, or uh, the transfer of the roadway started in September of 2020. It went to the city in final draft form in April 2021, and the last comment and discussion we've had with the city attorney was in September of this year, 2001. I, I, don't, I don't think that the city is clamoring for this property, for these, this road. I mean, I'm not, I don't think it's high on their list of, at least that was the perception I got, so. Yeah. Okay, um, yes, Commissioner Gerard. So, if I hear you correctly, they could have a driveway off of El Elm Street into their property with no problem from the county. That's not been, yeah, that's not been our concern. Uh, it, it would require us to retain the right of way and, and stay right, involved. Right. And if that's, if that's the purview of the board, then that's basically. So what, what would that driveway have to look like? Or are there any standards that at all that they would have to There are some general standards in terms of, and you heard a little bit of the discussion in terms of having adequate width, 
turnaround for the fire apparatus to up to a point. Um, there are some standard engineering specifications in terms of, you know, how much vehicle weight loading it can have and, you know, and some of the concrete dimensions and, you know, things of that nature that are a little bit more technical. But there's a very different, obviously, price tag associated with a driveway construction versus a roadway construction. Okay, but they would also be responsible for having any um, consideration of the fire trucks and that sort of thing in building their driveway? Yes. Yeah, so Even though there's not any, there's nothing there now, right? I mean, as far as I can tell, it's just. Correct. The, uh, if you go back to the, the photos that were included in the county's presentation, it's a unimproved, it's gravel. Uh, right. If you recall the, the photograph that was um, from Elm Street looking east, there is an existing fire hydrant that's located there on the corner of the south uh, east corner of Palmetto and Elm Street. That's over 150 feet, so that's why the fire marshal would require the ability to come in. Now, what you heard uh, testimony earlier is they don't necessarily have to come all the way back to the property, but they do have to have the ability to come in, have the T turnaround as was described. There's a multiple different ways to design that, but it has to have the appropriate weight to support that large fire apparatus and to be able to turn around. If that can be accommodated uh, to the fire marshal's satisfaction, then that would be the extent of the, let's say, oversized driveway, so to speak, for lack of a better description. And then from that point to the subject property would be your, your typical you know, residential driveway. So do you know, uh, the applicant was talking about having or planning to put sprinklers in the house with uh, a reserve tank just in case they needed to, I mean, is that something? From the county's position, <laughs> if, if the fire marshal is accepting of that, then we're not gonna take a different position than what the fire marshal is saying. And that means they would not have to have an oversized driveway. They would have to have it up to they? a point. Um, okay. Because what, essentially what the, the and I, I don't wanna speak too much on behalf of the fire marshal, but they're not gonna to want to stage a fire apparatus out on Elm Street, given the volume of, of traffic that it, it provides. They're gonna to wanna to come down Palmetto to a certain point. Mm -hmm. Now, they're not necessarily gonna to wanna to drive up to the front door, right. but, but they need to be able to come off of Elm Street and, and stage and be able to you know, get their equipment out, connect to the fire hydrant, run it, and, and do what they need to do in order to adequately you know, fight the fire as necessary. And so the weight of that road has to, at that point has to be sufficient, the construction of it has to be sufficient to hold the, the apparatus. Because what you don't want to have happen is in wet conditions or inclement weather, it starts, now you're putting that, that rig at risk. Um, so, and then there's obviously the ability to turn around because they, they aren't gonna wanna back that rig out onto Elm Street. And so that's typically some of the design drivers that go into consideration when you're, when you're looking at those, the size of those driveways and the turnaround pieces. Okay. But Blake, that, 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 that's gonna be required again. I just want this clear. And yeah. this is why I'm not sure whether a vacation is necessary, but it's gonna be required right. whether we have a vacation or not. Correct. The same requirements are gonna be made. And, the, and you don't need, and let me be clear about that, you do not need a vacation to accommodate the driveway that they need. Can, can you build a, a private driveway, you know, within the existing right-of-way and service? That's where we started from the county's position. That's, that's where those emails that you're hearing referenced, that was county staff's position, is that you could build a private driveway, so it'll be the larger driveway on the western portion of Palmetto and then a narrower driveway that, that functions back in here. Understanding, this is really the position that the county is trying to, the staff is trying to frame up for your consideration. If we do that, if we as a county make that decision that that's the appropriate way to support the development on this site, what we have been told at the staff level is that is gonna preclude the transfer of that right of way to the city. They're not interested. So it's a question of whether we're comfortable with that decision. That's not a decision for us to make. We're trying to frame up the issue for you all. They've said either all or nothing and 
So we're trying to find ourselves in that middle spot. I have one more question. Yeah, go ahead, Commissioner Girardi. So <laughs> what if they didn't do any driveway at all? I mean, there obviously people have been driving through there. Can they just leave it completely unimproved and have a dirt or gravel driveway up to their property? I, my understanding is the fire marshal would not look favorably on that because it's too, the separation is too far. Because right now you have a, like I said, the fire hydrant there, they have certain protocols and I'm gonna go off of memory, but I believe it's 150 feet. Um, and so if the home were to be constructed, let's say in the middle of this lot, that's gonna exceed their, their length to be adequ adequately able to, to address that issue. And Church Street is not actually a street. It's really it's a paper street at this point. It's 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 dedicated, but it's not been improved. So so you're absolutely right. It's very similar to Palmetto in that respect. Okay. Commissioner Long. Well, that's, I know this isn't going to sound very good, but do we care what the city of Pinellas Park says what? about this issue? Safety Harbor. Safety Harbor. Oh. Okay, safety we, harbor. We have, we have absolutely tried to uh, be good neighbors and, and partners with them and, and facilitate the conversation, but, but to your point, Commissioner, we've, you know, it's kind of, we've asked them, they're waiting to see what happens here. There's been some back and forth in that discussion. I reached out to the city manager. We've had staff that's been communicating with, uh, I don't want to speak negatively. They're not here to represent themselves. They were provided the opportunity to be here. Um, they decline. Commissioner Flowers. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I guess I'm still a little confused. I understand because I'm looking at slide six that shows the fire hydrant out on the main road, which is what I'm assuming that you're talking about when you say that they don't want to be out on a main heavily traveled traffic road. They want to be able to drive up into what is now this dirt gravel road to get back to the two lots in the back. However, if there was a fire or something for the house that we're looking at in slide six, they would be blocking traffic. So that kind of doesn't make sense to me. I'm not a fire chief and right. I don't understand all of that, but you know, you block what you have to block if someone needs your help. I know this is something that we don't do, but I just find it strange that this requirement, which is a hefty price tag. I mean, we've had other conversations with businesses where it's a hefty, hefty price tag and no one informed them of this even prior to, maybe they would not have purchased those lots back there if they had known that they were gonna have to build a road um, in order to be able to uh, have um, fire emergency services. Maybe they would have decided not to do that because they would have seen the cost implications. However, at this point, they're a year in um, and one home out. <laughs> because, yeah, you know, I was going to say something else, but that wasn't right. That wouldn't be right. <laughs> uh, one home out um, by no fault of their own. Okay, this is a learning process. Um, and then I heard Miss Barbara, I think is her name, say that when they went in to do the same thing, they had absolutely no issues. Is that because, well, first of all, is this their house, Miss Barbara? Is that their house, the one that we're looking at on, on slide six? Um, I don't believe so. Commissioner Flowers? Right here. Uh, look at the, I think the easiest one in my opinion is the petitioner's application and it's slide 10. Okay. It's so much easier to tell who owns which lot. Um, can we switch? Can we switch over? The, and I can it's the petitioner's presentation, slide ten. Okay. I find that it's it's so much easier to kind of figure it out. Although it doesn't show Miss um, Barbara's house, I think, which would be to the direct west. Petition to vacate. So and, and so what to Commissioner Flowers to your point while that's coming up the two sides of, of Palmetto that were vacated one is to the west of Elm Street and all those mm -hmm. properties that front on to Elm Street um, so um, so a fire truck could get to them as the point. right so so all of these properties that are along the west side of Elm Street 
have frontage onto Elm Street. So the vacation of Palmetto um, was not a consequence at the time. Yeah, and, no. it, and it's only, and the same thing is, is true over here where it says commercial park. Um, they all, in fact, it's off the slide here, but there's also a, a road here that fronts uh, on all of these properties. So all, nobody was denied access to their property. They all have access. So the um, point that was made earlier with Mr. McNeil's property here is his home exists this, in these blue properties on the, on the frontage of Elm. If this were to vacate, and this goes back to Commissioner Egger's point, he could combine these lots and make it all one. Right now, there, there are five independent lots. If the desire was to sell these off independently and have these built individually, that's somewhat hampered by the fact that if Palmetto gets vacated, they no longer have access to that property from Palmetto. Somebody would have to improve church to make that have viable access, which wouldn't be affected by the action being requested of you this evening. And the same thing is true with the Corellis. They own a, a number of properties, um, none of which rely on Palmetto for access, but again, they have access down here off of Cedar and then off of, off of these would have access off of Church. I kind of wish the fire chief were here because I know you said that that would not be his preference. You know, you were speaking from just um, topical prior conversations that would not be his preference, but it doesn't mean that it couldn't be done, that they couldn't hook up. If his concern is safety in case of emergency, that doesn't mean he couldn't hook up from the hydrant right there on the main road to get it back to their property. It would be his preference that they are closer. Is, well, because I can't even see how they could do a turn, even if that road is improved. Right. I can't even see how they could do a turn if they pulled their truck in, because you see the foliage and whatnot behind. I don't even see how, even if they do the improvement, how so, a fire truck would be able to go up in and do a, a half point turn to get back out. Your, your point is well taken in that there are uh, existing trees in Palmetto. And so to the, the advantage that the driveway has is it can meander through and around those. If you were to improve the, the full roadway, um, many of those would have to be removed. Now there is a design alternative, what they call a T turnaround, which is essentially a three point turn. Mm -hmm. So they would have the ability within the existing right of way to make that basically left hand turn back up and then, and then correct and go out the, the right way. And so there would be adequate width uh, within the existing right of way to make those type of vehicle maneuvers, but you'd have to build the roadway or at least that portion of it to, to be able to accommodate that full width. Now, the other piece I wanted to mention is it really comes down to, and, and you're seeing this a bit more when we look at development throughout the county, is that the fire apparatus, they're, they're working off of the standardized equipment that they have on these rigs. So part of when they set those distance to the fire hydrants become, is based on what equipment they have available on those fire apparatus. And so one of the concerns is they will, typically hooked to the fire hydrant, and then they have a certain amount of hose that they can stretch and be able to, to address that. And so one of the concerns is that fire hydrant's too far away, then you either need to have some other means of fire suppression, like the sprinklers, or in some cases, and that's not, the, it's not what's been stated here, is they will require you to add an additional fire hydrant even closer to be within that certain distance and proximity. So right now, as part of this discussion, because that fire hydrant's located there at the corner of Mr. McNeil's property, um, the distance is too great based on their current equipment available, so that's why they're requiring this, the sprinkler and the reserve tank that you heard mentioned earlier. Um, did I hear the petitioner to say that she had a document um, relate, relative to the fire department's Position. Uh, July second uh, emails. What I what I took notes down on from the fire marshal. And and from that stated that he that they will be accepting the turn the, the T turnaround and the and the fire suppression. Yes. So the T turnaround and the fire suppression. Okay. Um, I, I do have one more for Mr. Uh, Commercial Commissioner Justice uh, Barry. Did you have a comment? I'm going to go to Commissioner Justice. Go ahead. 
Okay, two, two things. One, uh, Matt Spore, the city manager of uh, Safety Harbor is watching and, and so he was texting me. So I was just gonna relay a couple of those comments. Some of the issues with the fire apparatus is uh, that's uh, per the, fire, the state fire prevention code. Um, so the distances and things like that. But one of the one of the things with regarding them right away, it's that it's it wouldn't be a fully a fully developed road. They're just saying if if they're going to develop um, a road down Palmetto, that they if it was going to be with the city and the city was going to take over and maintain that right away, that would have to be developed to their standards. It doesn't mean it's going to be a regular standard city street. Um, that it would just be developed per their standards. Now, one of the things I just asked Kelly is, you know, <laughs> why do we care about Palmetto Avenue? She's concerned about the drainage, you know, on the North Piece, um, and why not make it the entire and the entirety of Palmetto? Um, because and and I'm, you know, kind of throwing throwing a couple of things out there because the issue is we don't want to maintain, you know, something in the middle of a donut hole. We don't want yeah. to. I mean, you it's heard the gentleman, the, or not. the gentleman talk about, you know calling and requesting help. The reason why we could not do anything up on that creek is because we don't have an easement. But when when um, the Rugas go ahead and develop that property, that through the development process, we can acquire an easement over the creek. And I guess the property owners adjacent has also said we could have an easement over that. And again, that would then give us that access um, that we could have, we could respond to those requests when, when things go awry. Um, with regard to Palmetto, you know, like Blake said, we had no opposition to a driveway. I mean, a standard driveway, whatever. But when we are trying to negotiate the right-of-way transfers, the position that we were provided was that it's either in its condition as it is today, or it's improved to standards. That means a road, and it was nothing in between. They did they they would not accept a driveway. So that's where we kind of ended up at an impasse with negotiating with the city. It seems, you know, there may be a difference of opinion right now, but that is the message that we received from the city was that it's not just Palmetto that's part of the right-of-way transfer, it's also church and some others. So it's all of them in this area. Again, it just kind of goes to, we've been working with all the cities for continuity of services. I mean, the unincorporated area, we really have this <coughs> little donut hole like, like Blake was describing. This is wholly within the city of Safety Harbor. Um, we, we really can't bring services in, uh, water or sewer. Um, it's, it's basically this small little tiny area of unincorporated um, that is really enveloped in the, in the city. So, um, well. I'm getting, uh, I'm getting uh, a little bit of different information. I mean, <laughs> Matt's text is you can keep the road forever, but if or the the sure that area Charlie forever, but first. if you if you want if if we want it, they want you know they they want it to be developed under city standards. I understand that it wasn't. It, it, there's several different questions. I mean, I I don't know what the, the board's feelings are on it, but you know, I I think that those could be. Some of these could be clarified in a fairly short time period if you would want to wait and have us follow up with them. I, I, there's, I don't, don't want to negotiate. Hold on one second. There's a couple commissioners who want to weigh in. Let me let them weigh in right now, okay? Commissioner Justice. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pete, can you go back to the staff presentation and pull up slide six? Um, and I just want to kind of orient myself to make sure I know what I'm looking at. But slide six is the one that has the fire hydrant in the corner there. So we have a, a, a semi two lane gravel d d dirt road driveway, whatever that is, that goes partially down, but not all the way to the petitioner's property. Is that correct? Yeah, it touches. Yes. Yeah, so, so what you're looking at in this image is you're standing on the west side of Elm Street, looking east down Palmetto. Um, and, and so the subject property is on the back left of uh, over here. So it's behind this kind of tan with the metal roof? Correct. Okay. So at some point when they decided they wanted to build, and it, so this dirt road, two lane dirt road with the grass median, the highly developed grass median there, <laughs> um, goes back to the point of the edge of the property owner's property. So at some point they were told or, or informed or led to believe that they needed a vacation in order to build a road that they needed to, 
I, I guess I'm wondering is who told them that they needed to even do this if we're learning tonight that they don't need the vacation in order to build the driveway to their property and build the house, the Jack built. So when when county staff met with the uh, the family that's desiring to build, and again, I want to be respectful of the fact there's multiple petitioners, but I'm going to hone in on just those that want to build the home uh, there. They came in and talked with the, the, the county staff, and that's where we gave them the direction of a driveway was needed, um, you know, 10 foot driveway that was referenced in those emails. But we also understand that because we are not the utility provider, we can't provide water, sewer, any of those utilities, that oftentimes that is the trigger for annexation into local municipalities when services are provided by others. And so the conversation then went to the city and there was discussions with their public works director about a variety of other things. And when Mr. Falcon came in and spoke with me, I, I've met with him on a couple of occasions in my office and we sat down with my staff and we're trying to kind of think tank this and figure it all out and try to do all of that kind of stuff like we often do. That's where there's still been a little bit of a, a chicken and the egg. We know the county wanted to transfer this roadway, so it was kind of, we're stuck in a little bit of, normally what we do on the BDRS side um, doesn't have that level of complexity. Right, and, and I mean, and I fully appreciate the end goal of the global project of the road transfer uh, long-term strategy. I think that makes a lot of sense. And this goes back to what I wanted to talk about a few months ago about annexation and enclaves and how I didn't think they were supposed to exist anymore uh, in Florida. But what do we have to what do we have to do to allow them to build their house in I mean I don't think anyone cares about safety harbors, desire for road, and we might have to put the roads transfer fund idea on the back burner for this project, for this area. And quite frankly that's the direction we wanted to seek from you all because um, we're, as Kelly alluded to earlier, we're in the middle of transferring all of that and to Commissioner Agner's point, it has taken a lengthy discussion around that. It's not just Palmetto, there's a number of roads that are part of that transfer discussion, uh, church included and, and others. Um, and so we, we got to a bit of a, an impasse on that discussion. And I mean, I didn't go out to the site, no, I, wa I wasn't invited to be fair. Um, uh, but I did not go out to the site before tonight's meeting. But, I mean, the house that's in the forefront of the picture is a beautiful house, and I think if you're gonna build a beautiful house similar to that, it won't be long before the city is looking to annex that property. So, um, <laughs> anyway, my two cents, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Long. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to, it sounds to me, Barry indicated the city manager from Safety Harbor was on the phone and or listening in, and had some input. And it sounds to me like there's plenty of uh, room here for negotiation and a favorable ruling for everyone. Uh, if the purpose is to um, not have an enclave right there, I'm curious about why or what would be the value of just annexing into Safety Harbor and I'd like to see if we couldn't agree this evening to postpone the decision this evening and let the staff get together with the petitioner and the city and whoever else needs to be at the table to see what they can come up with to resolve these issues because from where I'm sitting here, it seems like there is quite a few miscommunications or misunderstandings or pieces of information that are not complete. We're certainly happy to do that again. That is well, I mean, with made. some time <laughs> certain so that it isn't going to take uh, another listen, six sorry. months or whatever. I suggested to Matt that we meet Friday morning, so. Well, there you go. <laughs> Commissioner Gerard. Yeah. <laughs> Commissioner Seal. Thank you. Um, I think my bottom line, and if Mr. Spore is still listening, if the city is going to require that they um, annex to get water or sewer, this is all a moot point, and it needs to be sat down and figured out. But 
I mean, I get both sides of the equation. I, <laughs> I know that the city of Safety Harbor, any city wants to try to not have mm -hmm. a pocket. Um, but if I'm supposing that if we um, transferred the right of way to them, then they could use that under our policy to go ahead and annex any property that has an indenture or has any, you know, ability to be forced to be annexed. So I suspect that's what the other surrounding homeowners are concerned about as well. So I, that's another heart of the whole issue. And I bet you Commissioner Gerard gets this. <laughs> <laughs> I believe the city has, and Matt can tell me if I'm wrong, the city has the ability to do that right now. I'm, each city has a different place. policy, though. Well, no, by, by state law, they have the ability to do that now. Um, I, I just look, I, we have, the, the, there, there was a few years ago uh, a state law that allowed some annexation of small enclaves. This is a fairly large enclave. It's not just one, right. one, acre, one par parcel. Um, yeah, uh, you know, the city is going to require, if they annex, they, they are going to require them to be on utilities. Sure. That's, yeah. there's no, if, I, I did ask that question. Yes. Um, there are some areas in the past, like, and I know in the city of Dunedin, that they were allowed to do that and they paid a 25% surcharge of utility costs. But this is a, this would be something new and would, they would have to annex. So that may be a moot point. I mean, from my perspective, we need to do something that allows them to build on their property. And if they want to use septics, I would tell them don't, but they want to use septics and they want to use um, well well water. I, you know, I don't. I, you know, we 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 have it's our it's our area, um, and to the extent that the Safety Harbor is going to require, I mean, they, would they say either leave it alone or build it? Don't don't improve it. Transfer they, it unimproved as it is today, or or to Barry's comments, you know, develop wow. it to a certain standard. They're just saying not. Don't develop a, a a partial thing and then ask the city to take that as part of an annexation or something. If they're going to annex, if they if they develop the unincorporated, it's a moot point. And Matt's okay with just requiring you know an ingress and egress easement. Um, so th those are some. And I don't think we want to negotiate this. I've heard I, a lot here, but but I, I I think there's a there's a common ground here. And and okay. I don't. Well, as long as as long as we have your and and Matt's commitment, as you said, to meet soon, because these folks have been waiting a long time. I think, and, we, and really, yeah. we have to find a solution for them to be able to allow them to live, build a home the way they want to build it. Right. I mean, in my right. opinion, I mean, I'm just one person, but it's just it's just over the top. And I mean, and and again, I, you know, I had some different conversations with Matt. You had some. They had some. He uh, Barry's having some with Matt now. Perhaps the best thing, as you said, is to meet with them. I'd be um, happy to do because that. Because to me, I, I'd almost like say, here, let's vacate it, let them take care of it. Well, but um, that's my, that's yeah. exactly, I think staff's looking at, at having the area for the property owners, but, and I don't, I don't disagree with that. We don't want some small strip of land that just vacate the whole thing to, the, to them and then require an access easement. Yep. Um, over the property, and then they can build a driveway to access their property. And then they have. Then to the issue really becomes if you're going to if you're going to do that in an annex to get water and sewer. Well, then you have to meet the city's development code. Or if you want to do it non-incorporated, well, then you're going to have to do water and sewer, and then it becomes a development choice. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. Commissioner Seal. One last question, because it occurred to me, that, well, probably two. Can they take the oak trees down? Are they in the way of putting a driveway or putting? <laughs> Based on our um, kind of site planning discussions and think tank that we had with the, the property owner who wants to build a home, if you do it as a driveway, there should be sufficient room within the right of way to be able to retain, I want to say, a majority, if not all, of the trees. There is room to meander and to do some of that kind of stuff. It's not your typical mm -hmm. 50 or 60 foot roadway that comes down through. That certainly would require the removal of the tree. But if we are able to do what uh, the county administrator is suggesting, which is an easement, a narrower configuration, then yes, you can get adequate access to that property without having to do a substantial tree removal. Well, I think everybody knows what the issues are now too, but I've, I'm gonna throw in there Kelly's need for creeks um, I, 
again, history will come into play here because way back in 2000, I got called out to homes that were being flooded by the creeks and the county allowed development of those homes in unincorporated Dunedin. And it's like, we, you know, be careful what we wish for or what we allow. You know, we want people to be able to have use of their property, but we also don't want unintended consequences. So let's try to get yeah. everybody in the room and work it out. Yeah, and I think they were talking about an easement over the creek, but also just a 10-foot wide easement instead of, a, I think, a 35-foot wide easement or something. Just right. It would be reasonable 15. on the access. Commissioner 15. Gerard. I'm just wondering what we need to do to get them to talk about it on Friday morning. Do we need to continue? <laughs> Yeah, what, what, hold, uh, you still have five minutes. I'm going to uh, let you come back up before we do anything, okay? okay. okay. I just, we're just, just get, we're just getting information from Jewel, our county attorney right now. And oh, yeah. She told me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I did. Um, my suggestion, if you wish to allow the staff time to meet with the City of Safety Harbor, would be to continue this to a date certain in January so that it is not necessary to re-advertise this case. We would save some costs. Um, you have meetings on January the 11th and January the 25th. Okay. And if that's included as part of the motion, the public hearing does not need to be yeah. re-advertised. And just a question, Blake, the, 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 the vacation request is all of it, right? There's four different, well, I guess there's three different owners, but they're asking to vacate the entire the entirety of Palmetto from Elm over to Church. To Church. Inclusive of the right. north-south alley. Yeah, I just want to make sure I was clear on that. Um, okay, any other questions before I ask the applicant back up? She has five minutes and six seconds. Just one more. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So just to re maybe reiterate, what, if we approve the vacation with the attached resolution that's in the agenda packet, that kind of gets us to where, I mean. That's their choice. Right. Yeah. If we approve the vacation, then as, as you're familiar with, the, the right of way goes to the underlying uh, fee owners of that. And so go to you know, basically split and go to those, Jewel can correct me if I'm incorrect in that statement. Um, that would give the folks that want to build the home the opportunity to create a driveway, but they'd have to work with the fellow petitioners to Commissioner Egger's point is like, now all of a sudden when you look at Palmetto, it's gonna be, Mr. McNeil owns basically the, the, the properties on the south side. And so it would go to, you know, that portion of Palmetto would go to, to the McNeils. And then the north portion of it right. would go one to the owner to the northwest and the other one to the owners of the northeast. So they would still need access easements and you know other ways to, to get back to that subject property. It doesn't all go to just the one homeowner that wants to buy the so home. So yeah. if we granted the easement, in worst case scenario, they go out tonight and get in a fight and decide that they don't want to allow access, then they're completely they're no access yeah. to their property. So, or so, if they so, wanted to put a price tag but, on that. But we, could, but we could, but we could. And I mean, everyone's smiling tonight, but you know, yeah. you, you bump someone's <laughs> car on the way out in the parking lot, things change very quickly. But, but we could, we could vacate subject to an easement being granted by all three property owners. Yes, and, and that brings up a point of clarification that, that may be worth mentioning. There was a comment made about the purpose was to give people, you know, the purpose of a petition to vacate was to give people access to their property. I disagree a little bit with that statement. The purpose of a petition to vacate is to determine whether or not there's any public need for that, that right of way. If we don't have a public need, we can certainly, for lack of a better description, vacate our interest and then the, let the chips fall where they may, to Commissioner Justice's point, and let them negotiate however they want to, the, the access, these private easements, and, and facilitate that. We're not in that conversation at that point. Um, you know, and so it, whether they want to charge a price, whether they want to negotiate a deal, that's not for us to opine on. But, but we could vacate the property subject to easements being agreed to. Absolutely. Okay. Um, I, you know, again. Or we could retain the right of way and allow for a private drive to go through that 
and maintain that way too. Yeah, but so. you know, you, you're talking about having to worry about taking care of it, and then if some future owner decides they want to annex and get utilities, then they've got all these other different issues. And so, for them to it was a vacate, making sure that they have an easement that's wide enough to accommodate uh, a future right. need, if you will, from uh, for going into the city. You know, it might be lot, maybe a wider easement than just a 12-foot wide r roadway for what the county's requiring. It may be, need to be 25 feet easement so that if they decide down the road, if future owners decide down the road that they want to become it, it, part of the city of Safety Harbor, they may need that easement. Yeah. And, and Jewel, maybe you can speak to this, the right of necessity in terms of being able to access your property and, you know. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not going to opine on what would affect the private interests here because rights of necessity, if you were to vacate, would involve strictly private property interests at that point. Um, you know, really, if you if you vacate the easement tonight or vacate the right of way tonight, um, that property is going to, by operation of law, inure to the abutting property owners, and it's going to be strictly up to them to work those things out. Um, it's really going to be a private property issue at that point that would have nothing to do with the county. So you're saying we can't do what I asked? I mean, I think that you could make your vacation subject to it, but I would certainly not want to get into giving any sort of opinion on whether there'd be a way of necessity. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not, okay. All right. Um, okay. Anything else before we ask the applicant back up? Okay, come on, come on up. I want to let her speak because uh, she's a brains and I'm a pretty face. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. <laughs> it's the first I time we I, argued ever yeah. with my husband who is going to present this case. <laughs> Yeah. Go, go ahead, Zilia. Thank you. Commissioners, thank you for meaningful discussion. Thank you. We, we feel that you understood our needs, understood the problems that we issue, understood what's, what's going on with this property. And thank you, each of you. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner Justice, Commissioner Flower, Commissioner Long. Thank you very much. We really appreciate the time. We are really trying to access the property, build the house. and. Um, to the first point of um, Commissioner, uh, Commissioner Justice saying that who directed us to go to this direction to vacate property. And it's actually DRS who suggested to try to do it with the commissioners and we really appreciate they, they advice and we took it and now here are in front of great people and feeling support from everyone. Thank you. And uh, to the point of uh, Commissioner Flower that you raised, it, it is true, it's not heavily heavy road, Elm Street, it serves only six households and some property on the back. And uh, so the traffic is very, very low and we wanted to keep it that way. We, we already had an accident that was a runaway over the little dock of our neighbor and we, it was a tragedy for all of us. So we want to keep it small road, not heavily, and not heavy traffic and we want to keep it that way. We don't want to develop multifamily. We submitted our application for single family home and it's been sitting in the county on hold right now as of August 12th. Submitted. To the point of that, may I have my uh, presentation, please? That property owners on the back will not have access. We do have agreement signed by all the affected property owners that would allow access to the uh, properties on the back to 728 Elm Street. So both of these properties will have access. We have Mr. McNeil's property will have direct connect to the Elm Street. So Mr. McNeil will have a sh share that belongs to this property to will assign to the back of the property. So back property will have direct access to the Elm Street. And we have agreement that says that we will have a access, direct access to Elm Street. And we signed it. So we are in all agreement between neighbors. We work it out between ourselves. And we will be able to do it in the future. Yeah. 
And to the next point raised during that dis discussion, that county indicated there is no plans for this Palmetto Avenue. There is no public need. There is no one reason it was shown that county needs it. That's why we're asking, dear commissioners, we need it. <laughs> it would solve 99% of our problems. And we will be so close to get our permits approved because they have been sitting there, submitted last version on August 12th, and they've been on hold. We addressed all safe, uh, fire marshal safety concerns. We accommodate all his suggestions. Fire is not jeopardized. We don't want to put neighborhood in danger. Thus, and lastly, we are fine. We are totally in agreement with conditional improvement of this petition to vacate on any conditions that, that commissions deem appropriate. If county requires access to Ali, we are fine. We are suggesting, ten, we think that 10 foot would be enough, but if commissioners think that county requires what they needed, we are totally fine with that. Please, we are not objecting. It should not be a reason for denial of our petition because the whole point of bringing this, we need this Palmetto Avenue. And we also in agreement with a conditional approval of anything, placing any easement on Palmetto Avenue. Just please hear us and grant our petition on Palmetto Avenue. And then we will decide if we want to annex to the city and comply because what right now city is asking is unreasonable. Thank you very much. And I will reserve one minute to my husband. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I got 36 seconds to say uh, in our communication with the DRS when they suggested to come to this meeting. We asked them a straight question. If this uh, vacation granted, will it solve our problem? And the answer was yes. Uh, also, just quickly, briefly, fire hydrant is 500 feet per county code from the property, from the dwelling. Uh, so we're not going to have any issues with a fire hydrant. And uh, we've been trying to accomplish this for a year and a half. So I just want to kind of put a timeline in there. So I guess that's it. Uh, we've got Kay. no time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. So, so what I was going to ask you, it's, it's, it's good that she gets 19 and a half minutes and you get 30 seconds. She did, she, she did a great job. Her half. She did a great job. Um, so, so I did, I did hear you say that um, we could either vacate, um, vacate with the condition that you get a legal easement put in there. I mean, I heard you, you have, have a basis for an agreement, but, um, who knows down the road, so you have a, 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 an easement there. You also said that you would be willing to provide an easement on the north side of your property. Um, I think they were asking for 25 or 35. You said 10, maybe 15 feet or something that would allow our folks to come in. And is that what I'm hearing, Kelly? Is, is, let me ask Kelly if 15, 15 feet on that north side, 15 foot easement would be yeah, that'll actually come into play when they when they um, go through the permitting process with DRS. So you know the code says basically we need 25 feet over the creek, and then we needed an additional for access. So we'll have to work with work with them through the permitting process to see what that looks like. But um, it is a major drainage channel, and I was speaking with him at back in the back, and he obviously. Kind of, can I say what you, okay. He conveyed to me that he would prefer not to have the responsibility for that right. um, as it is a liability. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, so we'll, we'll be looking at some amount of, of, of easement area to, to access. So I just want to make sure that, again, that's not been determined. The reason why we didn't reach out in agreement with the public works yeah. was uh, they proposed 15 feet from the fence and that will automatically make three uh, f existing structures encroaching into that easement. So it was uh, out of the question right away. So uh, on the north side of the property, I don't know if you can see there is a mobile home and two sheds that are already there. So we don't mind granting uh, some area, but their request was 45 feet, which is two full lots on the north side as an easement. 
Uh, I understand that this is actually, this overlay is not proper on this map. The, the property lines are a little bit south. I, I don't know if you can see, but the 734 house uh, is uh, on, the, on the south side. It's actually like half of it shows in Palmetto Avenue. So it's actually, it's a little bit All skewed right. to the. Okay. Um, okay. Um, any st staff, any final thoughts? Um, what's the what's the um, wish of the commission? Uh, we got two two easements or, or two vacations that we're, they're asking for vacation, um, and we, you know, I'm just saying subject to an easement being agreed to by the property owners. So you got to get that, and then subject to a reasonable width easement on the north side for access to maintain the the creek or I'll just say reasonable I mean I don't I, I don't want to I, mean, I don't want to limit it right now I mean Kelly doesn't want to limit it I I, I don't want to be 45 feet I don't want to be five feet either so I don't believe that the drainage easement is a part of what you're hearing tonight. It's we're totally talking about the vacation of Palmetto and the paper, the alleyway. There was no opposition to the alleyway. Okay. Um, it was we were so we're just talking about Palmetto. The actual, you know, permitting of their home and where that drainage easement will be negotiated during the permitting process. I know. I just didn't want them to that negotiating all of a sudden turns out to be 45 feet. If there was something reasonable that we could put in there, that access, so that they can get to it. it it's really it's not appropriate to be trying to connect the easement for drainage to this right away issue. Okay. All right. So much for my inappropriateness. Um, okay. Uh, yes, Barry. Because I know you're deliberating whether you wait, whether you go ahead and grant this. So just the the food for thought is this: you've got two two properties there in the back. If they ever want to annex into the city, you've got to be on a public right of way. By granting the vacation, now they're not going to be, and so they would have to develop and unincorporate it. And that goes back to your question about: Are you sure you want to, you know, develop without water and sewer? That's that's reason. There was a few of those issues that, you know, I thought maybe we should look at one more time and advise the property owner prior to th them. Um, going through this, it, it may actually hurt them in the long run. So, so to that point, Barry, asking them to make sure that they get a, like, well, let's just call it a 25-foot easement, that doesn't accommodate well, that? If, if, if we vacate this, then they're not they're not on a public right-of-way, therefore they cannot annex into the city for an access water and sewer. Even with the easement in place? Even, I, I believe so, but that, those are some of the, I, I'm not sure on that, okay. that's the reason right. I wanted to meet with the city. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Church, church is unimproved, but right now that is um, one of the uh, roads, right of ways that is part of the transfer agreement. So again, it's not improved today, but it could be in the future as there are other lots that are adjacent to church. Um, and at that point in time, that would all be in the city. Okay. I must have seen something wrong because I thought at the end of Palmetto on Church Street, mm -hmm. that little that little area was already private owned, privately owned by the industrial property to the west. So I mean to the east. So I may be wrong on that. So, um, did you have something, Commissioner? Well, I did have a suggestion about the oh, oh, yeah. Yes, Commissioner Gross. I think the point that you're referring to is. Oops, my my apologies. Um, was the portion that was vacated here. No, I'm talking about right there. Right, so yeah. church does come through unobstructed. It does It does come adjacent to okay. Palmetto. The portion that was vacated that's now private is on the opposing side. So not in Church Street right away. Correct, it's okay. on the on the east side. Okay. Yes, Commissioner Are Long. you sure? Yes, I am now, probably. Okay, so <clears throat> I did have a suggestion that we continue this to our uh, next meeting, very next meeting, and give Barry and the staff an opportunity to tie up these loose ends and plus meet with, <coughs> excuse me, the petitioner and make sure they're in the meeting as well so everybody's on the same page. Because right now it doesn't sound like we are. I will second that for January 11th. Yay, thank you. <laughs> All those in favor. 
You're losing control, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, I know. I, I, you know, what can I say? Um, okay, so you're getting a sentiment here to postpone this to, to a date certain, January 11th, to rehear it. But in the meantime, uh, county administrator and the city manager will be getting together and would have these folks. Let us meet with the city and then we'll meet with them. Okay. The two of you meet with them. I know you're not speaking on Matt's behalf, but Matt, uh, please, would you? Uh, I want to understand. I want to understand the the city issues and ours. So I'd meet with our staff, and then we would do a follow up meeting with the petitioners. Okay. All right. But you'll be at that meeting. I just want the. I want. The, I've set that meeting up for Friday at 9 a.m. No, I'm talking about Matt's. with them. <laughs> well, I haven't met with them yet, but yes, we will. Uh, we or you. I will be okay. there All with right. staff. Okay. Well, I just want whoever's in that meeting, yes. be at that meeting. That's just so that they. Oh yeah, yeah. no, no, no. I'll, I'll actually be in the meeting, okay. and and I'll meet with the petitioners. Okay. I just, I, I, there's a few things that I want to get answered. I don't want to put anybody on the spot. More importantly, I, I just want to make sure everybody goes in with their eyes wide open. Yep. And to some of these development issues, it could cause development issues that are be more costly down the road, yeah. and it actually kind of goes against some of our strategic goals. Uh, I would just like to address the agreement that we have between the neighbors. It's all in writing, and that will create uh, two flag lots. Uh, the blue lot that McNeil will have, the lot in the back will have an access to the Elm Street. And uh, Gonzalez, they are giving us their right. portion of the property that would create a Ruga lot uh, access to the Elm Street. So it's not the easement. It's actual, uh, the, basically, they, they just give it us uh, uh, their share, the quarter of the Palmetto okay. Avenue. So there is no question for annexation in the future. The back McNeil lot can always annex to the city. We all will have an access to the improved Elm Street. Okay. Thank you for that clarification. Um, we are, we do have a motion on the floor to postpone to a date certain, January 11th, and we have a second, and a commitment by our county administrator to meet with the city uh, manager to discuss any any inconsistencies or any clarifications that they need to get, and then, then they'll meet with you before that meeting on January 11th. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right. How does, um, how does a, like a seven minute break to 8.05 sound, everybody need a break or we want to plow on? Five minutes, 8.05 we'll start back.